Hello and welcome to round seven of the Virtual Carrera Cup 2014. Inside SimRacing.tv, the fastest show on the internet. Sim racing news and reviews since 2007, with new shows every week. GamePod, the ultimate race rig for those serious about sim racing. Puts you in the driver's seat with all the controls at your fingertips. Be number one on the road, in the race, in the game. GamePod, the choice of champions. So ignore everything I said in my first intro because this is, of course, round six of the Virtual Career Cup 2014 from the Turing Pro Series. My name is John Monroe and alongside me is Danny Asbury. How are you doing today, Danny? Doing good, John. Good to be back in the Collins booth. Obviously, I missed out at Thruxton. Some very uh, entertaining races there, but of course, Tim Heinemann took another double win, which is going to set up some very interesting... Uh, I guess, uh, outlooks here for today's races, John. So, I mean, it's certainly going to be interesting to see if TPS history can be made here. Yeah, of course. Tim Heinemann has won the last eight races in this championship, eight races on a trot, which has equaled the record of Stoffel Van Dorn a few years back in the Touring Pro Series. He's also jumped ahead of Jack Keithley uh, in that, that Jack Keithley got seven wins in a row and Heinemann has already picked up his eighth. And if he can win here today... That will make it his ninth in a row and break a Turing Pro Series record. And not only that, Tim Heinemann is also top of the ELO ranking. So he's now officially the number one ranked driver in the whole Turing Pro Series. What an impact he's made. Yeah, and you know, it's a bit interesting him uh, equaling Stoffel Van Dorn's record on R Factor. Because we've said that that record was obviously set from Stoffel on Race 07. And you know, you talk to people from that era in TPS and the cars were kind of, you know, un unbalanced and that sort of thing. So people always kind of put kind of an asterisk next, next to that. But here in uh, these uh, uh, flat six cars, every car is the same. And the fact that Heinemann has been so dominant in the same car, I mean, we've never actually seen this before in TPS. So, I mean, we, we've got to give the tip of the cap for Heinemann for what he's done in these cars. And I'm very curious to see if he can actually break this record here uh, 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 tonight, John. Yes, definitely. So just before we head into the qualifying session, a quick heads up on what's coming up in the Touring Pro Series. The next event in the Virtual Mini Challenge will be live from Mid-Ohio, and that will be round seven. And that will be the season finale, an epic championship battle between Chris Butcher and Eric Strana, two men who have never won a Touring Pro Series title. So those guys will be gunning for glory at Mid-Ohio, and it's going to be an incredibly exciting one. Uh, another championship battle, of course, coming up in the Virtual Touring Masters, which will be held at Bathurst a week on Wednesday, and that will be between Robert Riesmuller and Jesper Tolberg, but with lots of other drivers looking, obviously, to win on the mountain and try not to crash, such as, I don't know, let me think of a name, Toby Davis <laughs> uh, at Bathurst. And then the, thir the third of our four winter series will be the Virtual Supertech series. And speaking of that, we have some news about Alexander Lauritsen because he not only has sealed up the championship last time out in Cascavel, but will be racing in the Sirocco R Cup next season, following the likes of Sheldon van der Linde, who was champion, or Kevin, Kevin, I should say, van der Linde, who was champion last year, also racing in this series. So we've got a lot of big, big news here in the Touring Pro series, but let's just head into the quality session as uh, quick as we can. We have nine and a half minutes, and as you can see from practice, it was Gollenbeck who was quicker than Tim Heinemann. We can just find him on the server. Yeah, and a bit of news about that. The fastest time we saw from the week of testing was about a 105.8, I believe, and that was from Tim Heinemann. Thing is, Gollenbeck, his teammate, of course, goes at 105.6 there in the practice leading up to Q. So all of a sudden, there is something a bit different on, on, uh, in the cards to perhaps see a Hyman streak come to an unfortunate end at 8. So it, it, uh, Murray's going back has a chance to take a win today finally and dethrone his teammate because so far he is the fastest car we've seen through the two weeks of testing. So certainly something is, at, is in the cards here uh, for a potential upset. Yeah, and Marius did have a couple of tenths advantage by the end of the practice session, so 
as you say, he has been the only man to challenge really uh, the likes of Tim Heinemann. Apart from, you could say, Oscar Hardwick, who had a stunning round out last time out at Thruxton and almost managed to beat Gollum Beck and Heinemann. But it has been those two that have been dominating so far. Heinemann goes fastest provisionally on a 105.8 ahead of Marius Gollum Beck on a 106.111. So a few times coming in thick and fast. But we need to talk a little bit about the track, Danny, because the Elon's ringing, uh, Danish circuit, very, very tight and twisty by the looks of things. Yeah, it's a real uh, odd track. I don't think we've ever been here in TPS before. So, I mean, it's kind of built, a lot of drivers are saying it's built for front-wheel driven cars, but it's a real challenge to get these Porsches around this track. And keeping the, the tire temperature has been such a big thing with the drivers. You know, they're getting overheated. The drivers not sure what exactly to do with the tire pressures and the camber. So the drivers that can get that sorted on this tight and twisty circuit here, they are the guys you're going to see rise to the top and get the premium points uh, for paying positions. Yeah, and this is of course a 14 turn track, so many, many turns and many many of them second gear. I believe there's seven or eight second gear corners on this circuit with a few first gear ones as well. And Marius here ending the lap coming around turn 14. He's a second down in this one, so this lap won't be too relevant for the time being. But we'll see who else we can jump on board with as people Rodriguez jumps up to third. Let's see what Tim Heinemann's doing. He seems to be just beginning his lap, so it'd be a good time to jump on board with our championship leader as he now heads into what I believe will be turn 4 and this is a right hander turn 5, you just flick it down to second gear try and keep as much speed down and you have to slow down pretty quickly for the second part of the corner which is turn 6 now heading towards turn 7 and 8, this very slow chicane left hander uphill, flick it right over the kerb and keep the car together on the exit this is a very important part of the track you take it right over to the right hand side of the track and straight back left again so there's no real straights on this section of the track then a flat out left hander uh, at turn 8, heading now to the end, towards the end of the lap, this is just the end of sector 2 now, That's, that was turn 12, across the other section of track which isn't used, downhill right hand braking so very difficult and then get the power down nice and early, Tim's on a decent lap here, heading through the last corner, just put the apex and get the power down as early as possible and up to 5th gear as you head down out of the 14 turn track to cross the line and Tim improves by 3 tenths of a second, that's a stunning lap. Good grief, like, we were just going over this, the fastest time we saw before that is a 105.6, so yet again, Hyman just takes it to another level when he absolutely has to do it. Gullenbeck would have uh, surpassed his pole time, his provisional pole time with his uh, 105.6 there, but or 7, but again, Gullen, uh, Hyman is just so good when he needs to be, and that's why this guy's won uh, uh, 8 straight races. It's absolutely phenomenal how good this driver is once the pressure is on. So we've just seen Jesper Tolberg jump up to third for Spade Racing on a 106.157. But the man you were just looking at was Yoko Gorenk, and he will be delighted putting it provisionally in fourth place in this Division 1 race with five and a half minutes to go in qualifying. I believe that Yoko Gorenk was in actually Division 2 for the last round out of Thruxton. So to be up in their fourth place very early on in the session, okay, it's not the fastest time you're going to see and people will improve, but it's a good time to start off on. Yeah, uh, and we're seeing from the outside of the Spade uh, racing camp, I mean, Chris Hack was also one of the quickest drivers, another core racing driver uh, outside those uh, Spade racing boys, but unfortunately he's down buried in 16th position, so it's a left up to Yoko Gorin to now fly the banner for uh, core racing there in 4th position. Ke Kevin Siggy for, for uh, positive sim racing right behind him in 5th position before you get to the GT Competizione man in uh, Dio Diogo Silva. Think about Silva. Silva's coming off two DNFs at Thruxton and just, I mean, he, at one point this was the driver that led the championship but the mid-season to the la latter part of the season has not been good for Mr. Silva. Now unfortunately I believe he's 4th or 5th I want to say in the, in the championship standing so he's definitely got uh, a lot of work to do. He wants to recover perhaps a podium position before all things are said and done. Actually he's down there in 6th position in the championship standings we pull that up for our viewers so uh, yeah it, it's uh, Silva it, Silva though has a chance to recover the 4th position because Eric Strana, the ice cold racing driver you've seen in 4th position is not currently with us for this round here so Definitely a chance for Silva to recover, but so far, he definitely has to step up the pace. Yeah, and I think Diogo impressed many, many of us in the early starts of the season with his consistency, but he just seemed to lose it as the season went on there. Uh, one man you're looking at now, Sergio Jr., he hasn't been too consistent himself. We've seen him up there a lot, but also further down often as well. He's had a bit of a mixed bag of results this season, but he's still sitting in a good position. Uh, and as you can see the car now, you can actually see the track map on the left-hand side of your screen. So that is how tight and twisty and technical this track is. So you might have seen it on the onboard, but that's a picture of what the actual layout looks like, just to give you an impression as Sergio heads 
to turn one now. That was a poor lap by him, but obviously just warming up the tyres and getting set up for his next one. Looking down the order, Greg's dropped down to fifth, but that's still impressive from him. Kevin Siggy for Positive Sim Racing picked up his first podium uh, back in Norris Ring. He's running in seventh at the moment with Silva, the man we talked of, in eighth. Matty Orban for Optimum Sim Racing is sitting in ninth position. But looking at the name down in eleventh, there is a bit of a story about him. Now, he's moved down to twelfth now, but uh, we have a bit of a story about Fran Lopez, don't we, Danny? Yeah, Fran, uh, he, his, his usual wheel actually broke down on him, I believe, with the G27, so he had to go back to his... I, it's a wheel I, I've never even heard of before, which we'll say it's that ancient. He had to switch to this thing. This, that wheel actually, you know, he has to, he had actually, it was so old that he actually had to fix it up. But then what happens, his internet connection gives out. So he's left to, to, to drive 150 kilometers, I believe is the figure, to a friend's house just to participate in this race today. So that's what we love to see in the TPS, absolute commitment. This is one of those stories that ranks up there. I believe it was with uh, one, a, a driver who is driving, a Heinz Petrol, in, in fact it was. I think in V8 had a similar issue, like where he just got married, just moved into a new house, and then he had to set aside time, his internet was actually down. So he had to, I think, also drive off of his own premises to do a, 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 an event. Uh, such as this one today. So, I mean, anytime we see a moment like this in TPS where a guy is doing so much just to be in a race today, we have to stand up and applaud him. And that's one of these moments we've definitely had here with Franz Lopez, driving 150 kilometers, just driving the Toro Pro Series event. That's absolutely a commitment there from the positive sim racing man. So, we give you this guy a major hand here in the TPS paddock for putting in the hard, the hard effort to make a great here today. If that's not commitment, I really don't know what is, because that is an extraordinary story. He's down to 14th at the moment, just about across the Sector 2 line, so we'll know where it is, and he is 8 tenths down, which could still see him improve, but there's so many drivers on that 106.1, if he can just get some time in this last sector, we could see him get up just inside the top 10, but I don't think he's going to do it in this one, maybe slot to 12-ish. Uh, no, but he stays in 14th on a 106.547. One man has just popped up into 8th position is Oscar Hardwick, and of course we talked a little bit about Oscar after his stunning performance out there in Thruxton, uh, and he has actually been struggling here this week. He hasn't really had time to put in the practice. Only really learned the track properly today when I was speaking to him. And um, we were both just having a, you know, having a laugh driving around trying to learn the best way around the circuit. And he's done a good job to get that car up to eighth position as early as this. Yeah, he's a driver that never really does too much practice beforehand. He usually jumps on before the race starts. And yet again, that's that, that that's what he does here today. And I mean, up to, uh, inside the top ten for small power, that's certainly very good for those guys. They're just going to be happy with that. Hopefully he can push, perhaps get another podium like he did at Thruxton, but uh, a small update at the front. Chris Hack has jumped up to third position. Remember, he was that the fastest driver outside this, the, uh, the, the Spade Racing Camp. Meanwhile, Chris Butcher down in 23rd position. I talked to Chris before the race started here, or before we proceedings got underway here, and he said he's just really not that confident. Hasn't done, like Oscar Harwood, not hasn't done much testing. Uh, he's, he says he's going to try to luck inside the top 15 and see if if, if, uh, if he can do that, but that is certainly not looking too good him in 23rd position. Lewis McGlade, uh, we do have a bit of a news about him, John. Yeah, this is, his, of course, his debut for Smile Power in Division 1, and we he, he's actually just getting used to his new G27 wheel because he's been running on a controller for years. But um, to all of our annoyance, Lewis has gone back <laughs> to a controller for this race. And we're only joking, of course, but he feels he's a bit too dangerous on the wheel to take part. So he's going for the controller just to be safe for this one. But he will be using the wheel from now on. And now that that's being said live on the broadcast, Lewis, you have to stick by your word, son. That's actually going to close out the quality session here. Remember, only 10 minutes to work with. So it looks like we have time and going back from Hack and Sergio Jr. Eric Tavite is going to round out your top five. So three drivers are able to crack that 106 uh, uh, mark. Uh, uh, so so only three drivers in the 105s. And I think that's kind of what it was on live races leading into this event. So certainly no surprises here. Hyman absolutely runs a devastating time to take pole position. A few guys still out on track. I know Tavite is still on track. He's in fifth position trying to work his way inside that top three. Not really sure what his sector splits are at this moment, but he's really ringing out that ice cold machine. See if he can probe for any type of time and, and improve upon his fifth position. So far, I'm not sure though, John. Yeah, I'm not sure. We haven't seen any split times yet, so we're not quite sure. But I think he'll be approaching one rather soon. As yeah, just heads through this chicane here. So after this corner, I believe he'll be crossing sector two split. And he's six tenths off. 
so that's not going to see him improve unless he does a major upset in the final two seconds. But um, that is our qualifying session, which will of course wait until watch Eric Tobite as he finishes off his lap. I don't think he's going to go quicker, but still to be in fifth position is not too bad considering uh, considering the circumstances of the amount of speed drivers. I mean, he is ahead of the likes of Jesper Tolberg, so you can't be too disheartened with that, but he has abandoned his lap by the looks of things, and that rounds out our qualifying grid, so why don't you take us through it, Danny? At the front, we have Tim Hyman again for speed racing, taking yet another pole here. At Murray is going back straight in behind him, about two to three tenths off his teammate. Chris Hack, remember, he was the fastest driver outside of Hyman and going back through the two weeks of testing. Shows that form here today, gets third position. Sergio Jr. for go speed in fourth position with Eric to fight first of the ice cold racing cars. I think the only top ice cold racing car, obviously, to, uh, Estrada, his teammate, is absent today. Yes, for Talbert for Spade Racing is going to be in sixth position with Yoko Gorge for Core Racing in seventh. Oscar Hardwick does a very good job for Smile Power to grab eighth position. And you see how close the times are from third Chris Hack all the way down to even David Yunt. Only about two tenths in it, uh, uh, if that. So, uh, Kevin Siggy for Positive Sim Racing. Remember, Kevin did very well obviously uh, two rounds ago at uh, where was the Norris ring and then last round got a sixth position at Thruxton uh, is in ninth position there David Yunt rounds out the top 10 destroys his teammate Chris Butcher gets the top 10 there so very well done for Mr. David Yunt uh, behind him I think we have people Rodriguez in 11th if you mind scrolling through that uh, for us there John actually Diogo Silva is there in 11th position for GT Competition? A people Rodriguez, his teammate, straight in behind him. Mate Orbrand for Optimum in 13th with Lee Palmer in 14th. Fran Lopez, as we talked about, there in 15th for Positive Sim Racing. Uh, Thomas Erzin in uh, 16th for Core Racing. Florian Voita, who's had a very solid championship, hasn't been able to really get the outright pace he's needed, sits there in 17th. Heinz Petzold for Core Racing in 18th. Emil Salberg, ice cold, 19th position with Miguel Cordoso for GT Competizione in 20th. Kenneth Yerman for THR, the second THR car in 21st. With Kel Stenbeck for Optimum in 22nd. Chris Butcher just really gave up on that quality session a bit early there. Is in 23rd position. He's not going to be too thrilled about that one. But again, that's what he was expecting at the same time. Uh, Gary Lennon, ice cold racing 24th. Anders Nilsson, for Optimum Sim Racing in 25th position. Davey Van Der Veen for Aerostream, the first of the Aerostream cars we've seen in 26th there, with Luca Pecklash in four core racing 27th. Lewis McGlade, the, the wheelless man, the driver or the controller in 28th position for Smile Power. Uh, Boyd Rice in 29th for core racing. Santiago Nazar, the last of the positive Sim Racing drivers in 30th position. Old Mary's Mirabal, 31st for It Gets Better. And rounding out our field is the last go speed driver, Fabio Asuncao, in 32nd position, John. Yep, so that rounds out your grid for race one at Yolan's Ringen. And we'll take a very quick break, and we'll be back with action for race one, round six of the Virtual Career Cup. Inside SimRacing.tv, the fastest show on the internet. Sim Racing news and reviews since 2007, with new shows every week. GamePod, the ultimate race rig for those serious about sim racing puts you in the driver's seat with all the controls at your fingertips. Be number one on the road, in the race, in the game. GamePod, the choice of champion. So welcome back then to live coverage coming to you from the Touring Pro Series via Multi-BC. And we're just about to start gridding here for race one at Ylansringen, the round six of the Virtual Career Cup. And this is a quick look at your spotter guide too, so you can see a few of the standings and the drivers you'd expect to see and what liveries they will be driving in. So you can have a quick look at what kind of car your favourite driver will be looking for. But um, Danny, I believe you have a few things you want to talk about quickly in regards to the Virtual Mini Challenge. 
Well, yeah, I mean, obviously the big race is this Tuesday, but the deciding race where we see a fight between Chris Butcher and uh, Eric Strana finally come to a close. I, I just think this is one of those marquee moments in TPS history where you kind of, I mean, it, it reminds me kind of Tallberg versus Davis back in, I, shoot, I'm not sure if our viewers even remember this, uh, WTM seat or uh, uh, WTM World Toy Masters as it was called back then, Virtual Toy Masters as it's referred to now. Back in season three, where those guys had a, a, a season long fight that just kind of wrapped up at Mount Panorama. And I just remember the hype going into that. The whole week, the paddock felt it uh, when the championship was really going to come down to the final race. And that's what you're going to get again for uh, Mid Ohio and VMC. It's two drivers. I mean, the, yes, the, 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 I, I heard the field, the, the actual, actual grid is going to be flooded. Some of like 40 drivers for this race, but it's only going to come down to two, Chris Butcher and, and Eric Strong. I just kind of want to, uh, you know, congratulate those guys on a season well fought. And I, personally, you know, I'm looking forward to, as a fan, just tuning in to watch that. When I watched the last round of round, uh, what was it, round six, so, uh, and with great interest to see kind of how that thing was going to turn. So, again, it's going to come down to the absolute final race, mid-Ohio, a spot, what is it, 13 points within the championship fight. So, I mean, if you're a fan of of Tim Race, if you're a fan of the Touring Pro Series, that is certainly one you you just can't miss that one. I mean, why are you watching Tim Race? Why are you watching the Touring Pro Series if you're going to miss a, 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 a championship fight at its pinnacle? That's what everyone wants to see in motorsports. So, certainly, that is what you're going to want to watch on Tuesday. Marcy BC is bringing it uh, to you. John Monroe is going to be throwing it down. Make sure to tune in. And a week after that, of course, make sure you tune in for the Virtual Touring Masters finale, which is another season battle between Robert Wilson and Jesper Tolbert. So there's two TPS championship deciding races coming up to you very shortly. But of course, we need to focus on the Carreras at the moment. And as you ride on board with Tim Heinemann, we're getting ready for race one. What's your prediction, Danny? Oh, see, it's really hard to go anything with the time. It's one age straight. I mean, I had a glimmer of hope that Gollenbeck actually had the measure of his teammate going into that Q session. But then Hyman smashes the field with an a absolute uh, a dest a destroying lap of 105.4. So I can't go against Tim Hyman. I've picked against this guy all season. I rooted for my boy Gollenbeck. I just got to go Hyman. Hyman, I'm picking him to break the record, John. Get nine straight. Yep, well, I've gone for Heinemann all year, and I'm going to be brave <laughs> and do something different, and I'm going to go for Tim Heinemann to the race, <laughs> because, good. I mean, the odds are forever in his favour by the looks of things, and uh, it's going to be difficult for anyone to dethrone him, but that's not to say it can't be done, and of course, everyone has to stop him now, and then he can't win forever, although knowing Tim Heinemann so far, maybe that is the possibility, <laughs> but we're getting ready to go here for race one from Yulan's Ringing. We're going to see if we can see the lights on, the, I think you can see the gantry just above you there, as that Heinemann's crawling away from the grid there a little bit or just maybe nudging his car forward for the best possible place to start as we wait for these guys to think he reverses now Heinemann this is a bit of a strange way to start the race but just trying to get the prime position for the race start and there come the red lights that's two three four and we are about to go green here for lap one race one from Milan's ringing and we are now underway looks like an okay get away from Heinemann as they all charge towards turn one a very short run into that first left hander and it's Heinemann who takes the lead from Gollenbeck it looks like Chris Hack is slotted into third with Jesper Tolbert and Eric Tovite side by side for fourth position. It's going to be Oscar Hardwick in sixth with Sergio Junior seventh and Yunt eighth as they head towards the first couple of corners. Very good start from Heinemann. I thought we saw a crash there at the back but it was just something else in the background that caught my eye. Oscar Hardwick's made his way up to fifth by the looks of things and Eric Tovite sliding. Eric Tovite is tumbling down the order. Something's happened to him. We'll see if we can catch him uh, towards the back of the grid. But obviously there he is. An incident for Eric Tovite early on. We'll take a quick look back at that. Very clean start from the drivers, I want to point out. The only real uh, kerfuffle, I guess, Anders Nilsson lost that fuzz down to the field. And obviously, then Tavite had just a spin away from the grid. I think maybe David Gunn was in behind him. I'm not sure if there was contact, but of course, Tavite taking a slide down the field. I think he resumes in 29th position. So, unfortunate for a few drivers, but overall, very clean stuff there uh, for the first few corners. So, Heinemann leads his teammate Marius Gollenbeck as they head around turn 14 for the first time. They will cross the line in that order with Chris Hack in third position, the best of the rest at the moment. First man outside of Spade Racing doing a great job in third, under pressure, I'm sure, from Jesper Tolberg, uh, which is not the first time Chris has felt the pressure from the ice cold man this season. Of course, if you remember back to Leiden, and he was under pressure for the whole race and managed to hold on. Oscar Hardwick in fifth position. And he's right on the back of Jesper Tolberg, so maybe he wasn't expecting this considering he only started practicing properly a few hours before the race. And he finds himself right on the back of JT. 
Yeah, I mean, this is one of the drivers, him along with Chris Butcher. Guys who just really did off the line very well, are very strong in the opening two laps. Ryan Conn's another driver like this from obviously a PMC, a front wheel driver guy, but some guys who just don't really have the outright pace some days, but they can just find a way to get up into the premium point fame positions just through sheer race craft is what it is. So already a hot to hard was straight on on the money here. Jasper Talbert's right in behind him. And I think he's got better than taking out there overtaking Tauber than David Young has in behind him for THR. So this is definitely something we're going to have to keep our eye on as the race progresses. Yeah, it's been a great start for Young actually up into sixth position by the looks of things, but I'm not sure if he's going to have the pace to catch up with Oscar or Jesper Talberg. But we begin lap three and it's still the same at the front. Heidemann pulling a slight gap away from his teammate Golnbeck. It's now 1.4 seconds and he's clearly a man on the mission. Lewis McGlade on his debut in see in Division 1 in the Porsches. Looks like he's been in the pits already, so that controller obviously not helping the safety too much in the first few laps. And he's found himself in the pits, so that's a disastrous start for him. And hopefully he can regain his composure for the second race. But it's Heinemann, one and a half seconds to Golombek, the same gap back to Chris Hack in third position, so just hanging on in there. With Jesper Tolberg, I felt another second back and forth, so these guys spreading out quite early actually. A little bit surprising on such a tight and twisty track. With Oscar Hardwick in fifth, da David Junt in sixth, Sergio Jr. on the back of him in seventh, with Yoko Gorenk in eighth, Kevin Siggy ninth for positive sim racing, and Lee Palmer rounding out a strong top ten. Yeah, just an update from the back. Florian Boito, we've lost him, a, a DNF for an Optimum Sim Racing driver. Eric Tavai into the pits. Looks like he's got some damage to deal with on that ice cold racing machine. So, certainly Tavai, he's going to be looking for a, a better race two than he had in race one. Meanwhile, Tim Hyman at the front sets the pace 105.6. Now, remember, people, these, that's just a cool four tenths, five tenths quicker than most of the drivers can do under Q time. So, <laughs> this driver is completely on another level as it seems. So already got a two second gap to his teammate Marius going back. So uh, not really so much going on at the front besides Hyman throwing down the absolute gauntlet, trying to get this, trying to break TPS history in style with his nice straight uh, win. Yeah, as you see the car snaking through the first section of the track there, Heinemann looking untouchable at the moment out in front. He just needs to keep the, keep those laps coming in, and that is, as you say, qualifying pace from Heinemann, not the first time this season. He just needs to keep these kind of lap times consistent, and he will be looking at a new TPS record holder for nine wins in a row, and of course with the chance to make it more and more as the season progresses, with Mount Panorama being the final round in this championship coming in two weeks' time. But Chris Hacks just dropping off the back of Gollenbeck in second, and starting to become under slight pressure from Jesper Tall, but the gap's gone from a full second down to seven tenths so Jesper's obviously applying the pressure on the Englishman but he seems to be holding okay at the moment. Oscar Hardwick dropped a bit back in fifth position and David Jones has actually been impressively keeping up with Oscar and this is going to turn into a good battle for fifth if he can keep it there and also of course Sergio Jr involved in that one. Yeah, completely called this wrong. It seems like Yunt is quicker than Oscar Hardwick at the moment. I wouldn't be surprised if Yunt uh, tries to move on him uh, with only maybe a, only uh, maybe only a few laps. I remember 34 laps of extremely long races for the drivers. I know some drivers even joking about pitting. I mean, we saw to bike going, but of course that was for damage. It's going to be a long time to keep these flat six cars on this track and keep those tires in there. You, you've seen. Oscar Hardwick already lose the back end of that car. It's all over the place. That's simply, he's not going to be able to keep up like that for 30, 34 laps in the same set of tires. So the game has to keep his head cool. That car looks a lot more composed than the small power machine right in front of him. If that continues to keep up, David Young's going to get his position. He's going to be able to put a gap to Mr. Oscar Hardwick. And maybe David Young may be able to have a look at this podium before all things are said and done. Yeah, that rainbow livery obviously not helping the traction in the back of that Porsche, <laughs> sliding around every single corner it looks like at the moment, Oscar. And we know that is, you know, due to his driving style, he does have a, you know, he likes an oversteering car that's sliding about a lot. And he does seem to be okay in his tires uh, quite often, but um, yeah, he seems to be wearing a lot at the moment, a lot of tire smoke coming off the back of that car. And it seems to be more like he's taking part in a drift competition than a race. So let's see if he can hold them together for the full 34 laps. But Tim Heidemann has done another fastest lap of the race, as you saw on your screen, a 105.586 to lead this race by a long way. He's already lapped. That looks like is that Eric Tavite he's lapped? Yeah, yeah. I believe it is. And he's three and a half seconds ahead of Gollumbeck, and he's just said goodbye. I don't want to battle in this one. He may have had a, a good fun battle last time at Thruxton. That doesn't look like that's going to be the case today. And he needs to keep his head together for 34 laps. And you can tell just how the season's going and how dominant he's been. And you could probably relate him to Sebastian Vettel in the sense that we, we kind of feel this race is already over within three laps for it, Danny. 
Oh yeah, we're definitely seeing that type of a performance where you have one driver just completely dialed in on another level. So uh, yes, it kind of makes proceedings at the front uh, a little stale at points, but at the same time, you have to tip your cap to the man because everyone else has the same opportunity and the same exact equipment. It's just that Tim Hyman is better than all of them. So, I mean, just gotta give a tip to the cap uh, for Tim Hyman. It's pretty much all him at this point that sees that ridiculous, that monstrous gap he has of 36, well not monstrous, 36, 36 points in the championship hunt. About 3.5 seconds here, of course, uh, in the national race. And then the, the eight wins in a row, uh, which obviously ties the TPS record. That's all Tim Hyman, not his equipment, not his setup, just the driver. So, uh, we've got to give you a tip, uh, uh, give a tip of a cap to him. Uh, just going in behind here, I'm saying Diogo Silva dropped back to 17. Chris Butcher, meanwhile, has moved up. Uh, actually, no, Chris, I, the minute I say that, it seems to have run into some type of trouble. He's down to 24th position. Meanwhile, we're watching uh, uh, the aforementioned Diogo Silva go against Thomas Erzin, I believe that is, for Core Racing. As those guys nice going man. back and forth. Yeah, and it looks like Silva's got this one pegged. But remember, Silva, I think he started... Uh, 11th, I want to say, now down to 16th position, so certainly not a good start for the GT competition uh, only driver. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be rekindling any of the form he showed earlier on this season, and that is, of course, nothing bad to be said because we know how competitive this field is, but down in 16th position, he seems to be struggling in this race. However, he did pull off a stunning move there on Ter Thomas Erzen over the course of about three or four corners. He just teed it up beautifully and managed to execute it with no issues at all and has now begun to pull away. So we might have missed a you know a major mistake from Diogo. We might have just lost a few positions due to an error or maybe an incident with another driver. We, we don't really know. But all we do know is he's outside the top 15 and that's not going to help your championship situation, especially when you're fighting up there in the higher ranks. Looking, we've got a few DNFs. We've got Gary Lennon. Already out of this race, Eric Tvite two laps down in 30th. Pete Rodriguez has also DNF the uh, Diego Silva's GT Competizione teammate, so not a very good start for those guys. And of course, the Ultraman driver Florian Voita is also out in 32nd. Yeah, let that Leno incident just happened because he was uh, only running with us not even 30 seconds ago, I want to say. So, not really sure what happened there. Chris Butcher has some major damage on his THR machine. He was even, his engine was smoking for a time. Seems to have the car sorted out now, but it looks like he is pinned to the back of the grid in 27th position. So certainly not going good for the THR driver. Remember Chris uh, uh, also led the championship at one point. Uh, he's now sitting fifth overall in the championship standing. So not really going, not going to plan as this qualified 23rd position. Like I said, got to 14th, now down to 27th. Not going to be happy with how this race won is going. Yeah, I mean, you can't really blame Chris at the moment for not spending too much time practicing for the careers when he has no chance, of course, of winning the championship and he's got a limited chance of finishing top three. You know, uh, uh, while, he, while at the meantime he's looking in four days' time to be wrapping up his first Touring Pro Series uh, championship in the Virtual Mini Challenge, so you can understand where his priorities would lie there, but it's disappointing to see him so far down, having not obviously not completed too much practice in these cars and this track. But um, it leaves it makes it an easier job for Tim Heineman. It's one less superstar name to deal with, and he's just pulling away at the front. He's done a 106.1, which is one of his slower lap times in this race, but he still managed to build out a four-second gap in 10 laps, which is coming on half a second a lap, which is just a crazy kind of thing to be doing this early on in the race. You've got Marius Golenbeck still in second place with Chris Hack in third, and that gap is stabilized between Hack and Tolberg. There's still time isn't really relevant because you can see how close the cars are on track, so you don't really need a timing screen to tell you. And we should probably keep an eye on this one because it's the second time, as I mentioned earlier, that yes, we're talking from right over the back of Chris Hack's course this year. Can Chris Hack hold on for 34 entire laps? Yeah, now, I'm actually surprised that uh, Hack is still in front, to be honest with you. I remember five laps ago we saw this uh, battle originally start to develop, and it seemed like Carlberg had to put their car, but uh, Hack has still managed to hold on to that gap, a slight gap, at, at, at that, so... At this point, I'm not sure, Jackson Tucker has obviously made his name with tire conservation, and this is finally a race that can kind of come into fruition as being one of the longest races on the calendar this year at 30, at 34 laps. Uh, at, at, so, uh, Hack has done a commendable job to stay in front and to hold on that podium position, you know he wants it, but if he can actually get that done for the whole 34 laps, I will be extremely impressed with Chris Hack and keep the Asper Tarberg in mind. We're going to see if we can have a look at Lee Palmer's replay here. But yeah, I do believe it's too far back, so we're not going to see that. But Lee is just retired from a strong top 10 position, which is a real shame for him because he's had a disappointing season. And as we said, he's, he's had a bit of an underwhelming couple of seasons now in the Touring Pro Series. He needs to regain some of the form he showed 
uh, back in you know the earlier days of the Touring Pro Series, but he was running well there in the top 10, and it's a shame to see him not finishing the race. But yeah, as we were saying with Jesper Tolberg and Chris Hack, I do believe it will be a matter of time before Tolberg is all over the back of him. But Chris, we've seen him how good he can be under pressure. He knows how to defend, and he's an incredibly good racer who, can, who you know, over a long distance of time, can get a good result out of things. So it's a very intriguing one to see, and it looks like the only really big battle going on at the top of the field. Just having said that, I've noticed that Oscar Hardwick and Devjan are still right together. Yeah, and this is another battle we we obviously rode on board with a few laps ago. But we we know we commented that. Uh, uh, or commented rather, rather that Hardwick looked like that, that car was not going to be able to stay together for much longer. But so far, he stayed in front of Davion. He actually pulled a gap to Sergio Jr. at four go speed in behind. So now it's pretty much just a two car scrap between Yunt and Hardwick for this top five, uh, five position. And somehow Hardwick is able to keep that car going despite sliding around. I, I, you, you said that it was, it's kind of part of his driving style to get his car. Uh, kind of sideways under braking, really slide the car through the corner there. So he's doing it. You can see it. Too. You can just see the cadence of that car uh, just a lot more. Uh, he's leaning on the camber rather a lot more heavily than uh, Davion. I still think over over a course of 34 laps, that's still going to pay dividends for Yan. I still think Yan is the favorite in this fight. But so far, Oscar Howard still looking very strong in front of Davion and the THR machine. Yeah, and I know Oscar has been doing some wet weather driving, you know, recently. He's been taking part in a race down at Buckmore Park in the carts in the incredibly wet weather on slick tyres. So maybe he's still in the frame of mind of getting the car, you know, having no grip. And just as you see there, massive slide coming out of that turn. Manages to keep it together, but obviously trying to drive a car that seems to have no grip at the moment. And that might be to do with the fact that he's not a time to develop the setup to suit his style. But he does seem to be struggling on his tyres. And you can see again, he's just sideways on almost every corner and really struggling to hold that car ahead of the THR driver who is ready to pounce at any second. Just taking a look further back to see if we've missed any more drama. We have a couple of battles going on further down the field, but this seems to be the best one at the moment for this top five position. Matty Orban's been in the pits, which is a real shame for him. And he's now down to, yeah, he's down to 28th position, so he's behind Eric Devite, which means in this race you're not going to have much hope of getting a good result, and I think you'll have to just wait for race two. So, terrible start for the Optimum, guys. Now, look at this. You're seeing uh, this fight. I, I, it's not really a fight we're seeing. It's just that Oscar Hardwick is all over the place, and it's holding up David Gunn. It's allowed uh, the go speed of Sergio Jr. And even Yako Gorn for core racing to catch up to this. So, now Young's got to be thinking he needs to make a move because Hardwick is starting to slow him up. Uh, and, and listen, it's not going long before Junior's going to take a shot at David Young. And it's not long before uh, Gorn to get to this fight as well. So, now Young needs to be thinking, okay, Time to sort this out, time to make a move, enough is enough time to get my course through into that fifth position. So now I expect this battle to maybe even go to that next level. 20 laps to work with, maybe not got to get this done. Yeah, and I, I think he does have the experience and the racecraft to get it done in the long term. We know he's good at endurance racing, he's done a good result over in the um, uh, REC Endurance Championship, which he actually won a race for the Pro Series along with Matt Richards quite recently. So we know he's good over a long distance at keeping his cool and keeping the car on track. And he's also quite a smooth driver, if not always you know, right up there in terms of raw pace. So in sixth position at the moment, Oscar, looking as we said, like he's massively struggling with his tyres, he's got a big chance of pouncing as his race develops. Man behind Sergio Jr. for ghost speed, looking as dangerous as ever, and he'll be loving this race, just letting these guys battle in front of him, he'll be enjoying watching it and ready to get stuck into the action if anything develops. And of course Yoko Gareg just sitting there in the background waiting for anything to happen, but he's slightly further back and he's just really trying to hang on to the back of these guys at the moment, see if he can hold in the slipstream. And just looking at the order there, Kevin Siggy down in ninth position, definitely by no means a bad place, but he might be a little bit underwhelmed by that considering he got podium earlier this season. Let's see if he can make his way further up the board. But Tim Heinemann still has a massive lead over Marius Golombek, Chris Hack, and Jesper Tolberg. Yeah, and we're obviously riding on board with Kevin Siggy. Got a podium early on in the season. And like he's got he's got like this fight in in front of him right now because the longer Hardwick stays out front of the train, it gives a guy like Siggy, gives Emil Solberg in behind Siggy a chance to get up into this fight for fifth position. So I mean I mean you're looking at Sergio Jr. Jr. had maybe two seconds to these guys, only uh, two laps into already on the back of David Young. Uh, because I think uh, uh, holy Oscar Hardwick, so uh, 
Damien Young got to find a way to make this, make this move time because I mean, he can't lose that type of time uh, in any race. It's certainly not one of thir with 34 laps like this. It gives you a more time to kind of uh, uh, gain time in the opposition because I think Damien Young has a higher uh, advantage over those around him. Not really sure if he's going to have a chance to go after Jasper Taller, but certainly the longer he stays behind Oscar Hardwick, the more his tires going to wear off, the more he's going to get uh, a car equal with the tire wear of Oscar Harwood. So, I mean, if he really wants to take advantage of the, of the tire conservation, he needs to keep this move on Oscar Harwood and then pull a gap on these guys because it's not going to be long before now we're seeing, uh, before we see him in a five bar turn. And there's a slight sideways moment, and there it is for Young side by side. I, I'm not sure he's going to be able to get this one done, John. Um, Young does make the move down the inside. Oscar's going to have a dive straight back down the inside. There's contact into the chicane. And I think Oscar tries turning in. That's a disaster uh. for those guys. And it was just developing. It was going to happen. And Oscar Hardwick, if we can get here with him, that was a major shunt between those two. And it looked like over the course of three corners, a bit of tension developed between those guys. There was bumps on almost everyone. And it all came to a head to the chicane. So if you look at the replay here, Oscar hits David. David comes straight back into him because Oscar tries to give no room and turn into the right-hander and just make big connection and the fact that they both lost time due to an incident that was both of them being overly aggressive you have to say that was a bit of a racing incident and they both kind of deserved the punishment they got there see and i've seen this replay twice now so i don't want to be too hard on how but why do you fight this david is the fastest driver when you, you you hit him a uh, point blank right there and you give him no room on the inside and then you get hit again i i i i, I to be honest with you i kind of call this in david's favor because david and he, he was very clean about making that overlap. When a driver sits behind you for, what is it, about five, eight laps and waits patiently to make the proper overtaking move, and when he does, you sit there and you treat him like that, I mean, I, I don't know what you're thinking of if you're Oscar Harwood. You simply let that driver go through there. I don't see why you challenge that. And now, of course, both these drivers lose out to both the, the Siggy, the Salberg's too, Gorich and Junior go through. So four drivers, because I think uh, Oscar Harwood just fought a little too hard for that position when he's clearly the sort of the two drivers at the moment. Yeah, I definitely have to agree with you on that one. Yeah, I mean, Oscar seemed to make a mistake out of the corner beforehand. And which allowed Yunt to get the run on him and it was a very clean move by David in the first place and then Oscar was over, overly aggressive back down the inside into the chicane and just did not need to fight it because he was going to lose out in the end and it cost him both of them when Yunt tried to take the corner but the pink car was right there in front of him so I'd have to agree with you on that one but those guys are down in ninth and 10th now both paying the price for that incident and um, Oscar's got Yunt behind him all over again and Yunt's got yeah. Oscar right in front of him all over again so um, we better keep an eye on that one because we could see a few cars on the roof by the end of this one <laughs> But uh, back at the front, the gap has actually decreased. Heinemann's had a shocking lap of 106.6. I say shocking, obviously it's not bad at all, but it's about six tenths off what he was doing a few laps back. And he's now only 3.7 ahead of Gollenbeck, so maybe, just maybe, some incidents creeping in here for Heinemann. A few mistakes, and Marius Gollenbeck's not too far behind. Now, we saw a situation similar to this at Road Atlanta where in the second half of the race, the race came back to Marius Gollenbeck. He seemed to have a, a better pace under once the, once both the cars the tires got worn uh but at the same time at at uh, uh of course uh, at thruxton at norris ring it, it went back to Heinemann. Heinemann was just better at every stage of those races so uh, sometimes we see going back and kind of make up the gap on his teammate we haven't seen it since road atlanta really but at the same time that that gap is four seconds with about what is it 17 laps we have to go not 17 laps more 14 laps 15 laps here to go uh, not really sure if he's gonna be able to get this done but if he is he's got to put his hand put the hammer down now and just go for this um, 3.7 seconds I, again I'm not sure it, it, it's going up and down at this point certainly it's just it's uh, that's not going to be able to uh, pull uh, pull that gap in time here but uh, it's, it's definitely something to, for us to keep our eye on yeah, I think Heidemann obviously suffering from a bit of tire wear because he's done another 106.4 there, so uh, maybe that coming into play because I did speak to a few drivers and they were going to say that the tires would be struggling and, you know, we are joking about, about pit stops, but um, that basically suggests that tires are going to play a major factor. And just looking at the battle now, which has become the battle for fifth, the two men we were talking about that were sitting in there waiting for the incident to happen in front of them played out beautifully into their hands with Sergio Jr. picking up fifth and Garenk slotting into sixth position, but they've got a little bit of pressure behind them coming from the charging Kevin Siggy and Emil Sel uh, Selberg who's got up to 8th position. Um, so that's great, great job by those two guys to 
we'll increase that gap. And, oh, Sober looked like he was having a go there at Ket, the back of the positive sim racing driver, but didn't manage to make the move stick there. Santiago Niza is in the pit lane, which is a real shame for him, and Lewis McLean back into the pits again. So uh, maybe he'll use his wheel in the second race. We should try and encourage <laughs> him for that. But Kevin Siggy just struggling to defend there from the ice cold driver, but managing to hold on for the moment. They've, they're about one second off the back of Joko Gorenk in front of them, with Sergio Jr. just in front of that. And oh, Emil close right in under braking there, but Siggy managed to keep it together, get out the corner nicely. And this looks like a very interesting battle developing between these guys. And then, of course, a few seconds back from them. <laughs> I don't think we've seen these cars before in this race, Danny. I think they're, they seem to be new faces to this one. <laughs> but they, they actually have provided most of the entertainment so far. Uh, and oh, oh, we've seen a big mistake from Marius Gollenbeck. Just jumping back to the times there. We need to see if we can take a replay to that. Yeah, lost about something about four or five seconds. So certainly a, a major mistake uh, for Mr. Gollenbeck. Uh, really not sure we're going to be able to catch it there in replay. But regardless, that pretty much uh, Hyman is gone at this point, barring any type of cat uh, uh, catastrophe though for him. He's going to go in his ninth straight race. Not really sure if Golenbeck's going to be able to, uh, or if Hacks going to be able to catch up to Golenbeck. Now about 3.2 seconds off of Golenbeck. Meanwhile, we pick up with this fight uh, yet again with Oscar Harwick and David Yunt. Uh, <laughs> Harwick has not allowed David Yunt to get through. But again, like, we're seeing David Yunt, he's got the overlap. Is he going to get this move done now? I mean, Harwood, yeah, he, he, he fights that a whole lot less than he did the first time, and that was, I think, the correct, uh, perceived, uh, a thing to do if you're Oscar Harwood. Let's, let's just look at the cars, those who they got the overlap like that, and looks like, uh, David got now in the nice, nice season. Let's see if he can then, uh, try to re, uh, get what he lost in that first spin only a few laps ago. Yeah, a smiley face in the front of that corner, definitely not telling the story of the driver's race so far. <laughs> Struggling around there in 10th position, but I'm glad we could see like that. Well, look how aggressive Oscar was into that right hander. Obviously, carried a bit too much speed because lots of momentum. Because of that. But uh, yeah, just back a few minutes back, unfortunately, too much super lag as it has to be playing where it's gone a bit. But uh, obviously, he lost four seconds, and just everything we were talking about with uh, Golbeck potentially closing in on Heinemann is gone as Oscar Hardwick once again runs incredibly wide into turn one. So obviously, just pushing that Porsche a little bit too hard. And lack of practice on a worn set of tires is not paying off for the Englishman. Uh, in this race, things. and the man we told you the story about is in 11th position from the Up ahead we have uh, Siggy against Salberg and Gorinch. It looks like it's really starting to pop off. Emil Salberg had to overlap only a few corners before. Looked like he was going to make the move stick, but uh, uh, Siggy made the comeback. And now Gorinch has fallen back into the clutches of, uh, clutches of these two. Meanwhile, obviously the ghost speed car, Sergio Jr. has completely gotten away. About three seconds he has to all three of these guys. So it seems like this is the fight. I think Gorinch just doesn't have the outright pace to keep Siggy or uh, or, 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 or uh, Salberg uh, behind in for the, the ice core racing driver. But this, Emil Salberg looks the fastest of all three drivers. If he can just find a way to get the timing done uh, uh, correctly and get around Siggy, he's going to be up into seventh position. And it looks like we have two new casualties in the did not finish pile at the bottom of the standings. We have Matteo Orban, who obviously was in the pits earlier, has decided to park his Porsche, and Thomas Erzen is crashed out of the race by the looks of things in 27. So those two guys out of this one, and obviously the attrition rate rather high in this track considering what we've seen so far this season. That does mean that Santiago Niza in 26, although he's in the pits, is just as we say that Emil Solberg spins from, I, I believe, what was eighth position. Yes, it was. But we uh, saw Santiago Niza in the pits earlier, and I think he's still in the pits, so obviously having some major issues. And Lewis McGlade, good to see him pounding around Danny. He's, he may be two laps down, but he's still trying to finish the race and pick up some points. See, but here's my thing, and this is my whole thing with Lewis and the, and the whole controller. Okay? He was so upset that the controller makes him about a second faster than the wheel. And obviously makes him a fair bit safer, right? I get that. But at the same time, you do some offline testing, get 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 on, get in the grips with the wheel. Obviously, you can be more precise with the wheel. And if you're going to be two laps down anyway, it doesn't matter if the pace is there or not. But at the same time, this is not really a learning experience for Lewis because he's still with the controller and he's still getting a murder here. So certainly, the Lewis McGlay camp has something to look at <laughs> moving forward here. So uh, especially maybe moving forward to the final round, maybe at uh, uh, at Mount panorama if he's still with us uh, but regardless we're still riding on board in the Salberg. just saw the spin a few laps earlier and it just goes to show how these these tires really get heated up and then it becomes hard to get 
uh, script with these bugs. We're seeing, John just pointed out the DNS we've seen quite a, quite a few of them, and that's because simply I think I think as these tires get heated up, as these tires get heated up, the yeah, guys are simply losing touch with these cars. And who is this Abby Talbot is finally caught up to Chris Hack. Hack had actually gotten away from this fight by the second gap he had to call for a while, but it seems like Ashford has closed it down with about nine laps remaining here, has a chance to get this uh, this sought at the podium division. Yep, so we just start the lap 25, which means we have nine to go. And look how much JT closed in under braking. He's going to run wide into turn one. And maybe that's why the gap's changing all the time. Maybe yes, but being very aggressive under braking. And he seems to be making a little bit of a mistake there, run a bit wide. But closing in so much under the brakes, he's obviously got that spade force slowing down beautifully. Maybe not as quick in the race run as his teammates are at the moment, with Golmbeck and Heinemann a long way ahead. And Heinemann well on course for his record breaking ninth win in a row. But yes, we're definitely applying the pressure to Chris, and he'll be wanting to make it a spade one, two, three in this one. But Sergio Jr., as you know, down in fifth position with Hugo Marek in sixth. A great job considering he was in Division 2 quite recently, I do believe. And um, Kevin Siggy in seventh, ahead of Lewis Albert, who had a bit of a ago in eighth. Then the battling David Young and Oscar Hardwick are down in ninth and tenth, with Gil Silva eleventh. Fran Lopez, this man you heard the story from earlier. Kenneth Thurman is in 13th with Luca Peglage in 14th. Old Marius Murvold rounds out the top 15. Davy van der Venne is running in a strong 16th with Boyd Bryson in 17th and Chris Butcher a disappointing 18th. Heinz Petzold is running in 19th with Anders Nielsen rounding out that top 20. Shell Stenbeck is in 21st position ahead of Fabio Asencao. Miguel Cardoso for GT Competizione is in 23rd with Eric Tveit down in 24th after his many pit stops and Lewis McGlade now rounding out the guards are still running because Santiago Niza has retired. Yeah, we had another DNF there to pile on. What is that now? Six or seven, I believe, John. Overall, I think yeah, that's that's absolute. That's seven DNFs. So, uh, certainly something we just don't like to see here at the Toronto Pro Series. But at the same time, we talked about this this track just being so demanding on, on the drivers uh, that it, it's 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 kind of to be expected. But regardless, yes, we're tall, but the guy we're, we're Ryan Lombard with now. Uh, this is a, uh, here's his overall championship. He sits in third place, 177 points. Okay, so it's still a, a 377 point, I should say. Uh, obviously, Tim Hyman leads the championship with with 437 points. So he's still, you know, close to that number. He's not getting absolutely blown out the water here. But at the same time, this is a driver who is the winningest driver in TPS history. He's ranked. Uh, all time as the best driver in TPS history. Uh, ELO rankings, that obviously, that Hyman is the, the top driver, but obviously that's more of current uh, standings and, and, and what have you. But this is the driver, pound for pound, this is the best in TPS history. And you know, you, you, I'm actually surprised that he's never been able to really get to grips with the with this uh, uh, just raw pace of his spade racing teammates at this point. Hyman, Golenbeck, these guys are you know, on another level, and they're on the same team as him. So, I mean, usually we see this type, we've seen this type of thing before in TPS, and it's always Tallberg and THR and how they can fight to not get Tallberg back up at the front. But now, since the team is still doing so good, Spade Racing is obviously leading the team's championship. You're not really seeing that. You're not really seeing this team, you know, say, okay, we got to redial the car to get Tallberg to the front. So, if that's the case, I'm not really sure what we can expect to see from Tallberg moving forward with Spade Racing. I mean, we've seen him delegated to now the third driver on the team. The best driver in TPS history has been made the third driver on the team. So I, I it's it's kind of something I, I kind of scratch my head at. I'm, if you're Tallberg, why you know what? Why you go? Why do you go to a team like that where you're where you're, where you're the third featured driver? But at the same time, you know, the, the team is doing well. I mean, Tallberg is consistently doing well. He's third in the championship. I'm just, uh, but at the same time, when you've won so many championships, what, what, how does how does that really motivate you? So at the, it's a very interesting situation, I think, developing with Tallberg at Spain. I'm curious how this kind of continues up inside the TPS. I mean, I, are we going to see Tallberg back at the front in the main leagues? Obviously, he's leading the VTM championships, though. We say all that, but that championship is without teams. So that's something maybe... Uh, to look at obviously no spade no no thr no 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 any there's not a single team in that championship so uh I, when it comes to championships with teams and that sort of thing in there i'm curious how yasper talbert gets on moving forward in these things john i think it's definitely something to look at yeah i mean just before we get on uh, with our discussion of yasper talbert his former team thr their main driver for the series chris butcher we did see a few 
few laps back getting past because Chris has actually stopped on track and I believe he's out of the race now so disaster for him but um, yeah speaking of Jesper Tolberg I kind of get what you mean but you can also understand you know from a driver's point of view you're always looking to get go to the best team when you look at Jensen Button won the championship with Braun, next year went to McLaren. You know, you're always trying to move up in the world and be with the best team. So you can understand, looking at looking at the way the team standings are going, why Esper would want to join Spade Racing. And every driver has their day, but also every driver has their off days where they're not quite as good. That maybe a section of, maybe part of a year where they don't have as much time to practice, maybe just feeling a bit under the weather or, um, you know, drivers have things in their personal life that can affect them and maybe make them have a rough year. Look at some of the, you know, examples in real life racing in Formula One, you know, we've seen drivers no matter how good they are, they can, everyone can have a bad season. And although Jesper's having a bad season in this series, you've seen him, he's on top of the virtual touring masters. He's still, you know, obviously one of the TPS's quickest drivers. And I'm sure we will see him bounce back in the major leagues. It's just whether he can, you know, find the strength within himself to go out there and do what Heinemann and Golenbeck are doing and beat them. And of, of course, that this is just the virtual career cup. We have so many other series that Heinemann and Golenbeck aren't racing in. And Heidemann and Golenbeck haven't proved themselves in any other Touring Pro Series leagues, so you know they could just be poor specialists for all we know. We need to see those guys venture into their leagues if we want if they want to assure their uh, position in TPS folklore, really. Thing is, you know, Jasper Talberg, he won the first race of the championship. And when he did that, Jasper Talberg very rarely is at his peak at the beginning of a championship. When he won the first race at Monza, I th honestly thought he was going to walk the series. As I, I, I consider that this guy, because Talberg, he always gets better as the championships wear on. The thing is, I mean, well, we've seen Talberg in VH go against Jeffrey Rietveld. And Rietveld was dominant in those cars. I mean, absolutely on a masterclass. But uh, eventually, Talberg was able to line him up and was able to surpass Rietveld. The thing about Hyman going back, we've seen that, we've seen the same act here for, for uh, this round six. And Talberg still hasn't been able to get to these guys, get on these guys for a pace level. He's driving the same sub with them in the same team. And what is this? As we're, I just saw it's a bit of a contact there with a GT competition only driver. I believe it was Miguel Cordoso was caught up with maybe one of the ghost speed cars. But yeah, I'm not really sure what. We're trying to catch on a replay, but obviously it seems like we can't go that far back. But uh, regardless, those guys carry on. But my point about Talbert is that he's had now a whole season to line up Golenbeck and Hyman and has, hasn't been able to do it, despite being on the same team with those guys, practicing with those guys, and having the same setups. And so I, I just think it's very, it's very much a curiosity, I think, uh, how that all is carrying on there with Spade Racing. Oh, no. It all goes belly up here for Cordoza as he crashes, entering May the I get through, and, please? Is he stuck, John? I think he's stuck. Yeah. And Eric's, and Eric to, I think I was Eric Tavite trying to get into the pit lane, has had to exit the race effectively because the pit lane was blocked. And now Cardoso, oh no he hasn't, it was just a bit of lag there, so those guys do eventually make it into the pit lane, but disaster for Cardoso. And by the looks of things, he looked like he had damage and it might have been picked up with an incident with Oscar Hardwick. We've seen how sideways Oscar's been all race and he has actually retired from the race to become another casualty in this one. And Miguel Cardoso being in the pits now means Lewis McGlade could be up to 22nd position. So, you know, lots of drama going on at the back of the grid. Unfortunately, there was too much lag to see a replay, but I do believe there might have been an incident between Cardoso and Hardwick, uh, or either it was separate incidents and they both picked up damage. But this is all means that the drivers at the back of the field that are just wandering around, even if they're a couple of laps down, are picking up the places. It looks like everyone's really trying to get, a, get to as, as many points as possible because they want to be on the grid for Mount Panorama Round seven, the final, the finale of the series. Obviously, it's a big deal when TPS goes to Mount Panorama. So everyone wants to be on in the Division One. Uh, uh, usually, we actually open up Division One and Division Two. Actually, we we combine the two for a Mount Panorama race. Not sure if we're going to be able to do that here with Porsche, considering that the field count is so great. We have another 20 plus drivers in, in Division Two. So obviously, we can't have something like a 50 car grid at Mount Panorama. So these drivers are doing whatever it takes to really finish these races and get as many points as possible as we're watching old Mary's Mirabal fight against Fran Lopez. Remember Lopez going 150 kilometers just to attend this race here today. He really now wants to cap off this one, get as many points as possible, to get inside, not not the top 10, but the 11th position. As we're seeing a nice little gaggle of cars with Luca Peklash, Davey Vandev, and Boyd Bryson, I believe he's, he's, he's on the tail end of this thing. So certainly this is the, this is the way you want to finish the race in a nice pack of cars with only about a lap and a half to go lap 33 out of 34 laps so we'll see how this one all this all plays out here look at his traffic Tim Heinemann's got in front of him he seems to have a lot of cars 
Yeah, of course, on lap 33 of the 34, so he'll be crossing the line shortly to start his last lap. If you go on board with him, you'll see what he's got to deal with. This is the battle going in front of him, and it's absolutely incredible. But um, I've just been told that another thing about Heinemann if he wins this race, not only will he break the record for most wins in a row in the Tour Pro Series, as carnage ensues ahead, uh, he will also break the, the highest ever ranking on the ELO in terms of points. He will break Keith's record of the, yeah, the most points ever to be accumulated on the yellow ranking system. So, uh, that's a lot of things for stake here for Tim Heinemann, just as he makes his way through the carnage that ensues in front of him through the first couple of corners. And I think that carnage did involve Fran Lopez, who we saw, uh, if we can just jump on board with now, yep, he obviously lost a lot of time there, and as he lets Gollum back through, uh, yeah, he just he was running so well as well, wasn't he, Danny? He was up there fighting for his top 11. And he's lost it all. Also, another position change I just saw was Emil Sauerberg losing out to Kenneth Thurman, and Sauerberg seems to have a bit of damage. But it is going to be Tim Heineman we need to keep an eye on. Heading to the end of his lap, on the end, well, the end of the final lap of the race, I should say, coming up to lap Davy van der Venne, he's going to come round the final corner on lap 34, race one, and he's going to be a double record breaker. It's Tim Heineman who is going to cross the line, and he will take his ninth victory. Yes, I said it, nine on the trot in this championship. Absolutely stunning result. Very nice for Tim Hyman. That is your record. This is TPS history for the speed racing driver. I mean, and, and like I said, I tip my cap to Tim Heineman. This is something that took a long time for anyone to top. I mean, Keithley gave it a try in VSS. Uh, we, we've seen, I, I believe it was, uh, not Tommy Nelson, but his teammate. Uh, and I'm completely blanking on Tommy Nelson's teammate name in, in VSS season I believe one it was, season two rather. Yvonne Calamies was it? Yvonne Calamies, thank you, gave a run at this record. I mean, we've seen a lot of, we've seen a lot of drivers try and fail to beat Astafa Van Dorn's record set in ATCC. Finally, we see Tim Hyman do the deed, get, gets it done, nine straight wins in a row. I'm not sure if we'll ever actually see that mark beaten in TPS history again. I really think it's going, it's going to be that hard for anyone to put this type of performance together. So Tim Hyman, well done to you, sir. And I've just been picking up on the reason we've seen a lot of drivers dropping back and having incidents towards the end of the race. It was actually people picking up punctures. Um, so that's a very interesting one. I think the reason we saw, you know, like the likes of Cardoso dropping back and we saw on the last lap there, Fran Lopez dropping back from a top 12 position, it must have been picking up punctures simply because the tire wear has been so incredible in the circuit. So it was never over, as we've just found out for Tim Heineman the whole way through the race, he could have picked up a puncture at any time. Yeah, I mean, certainly that wasn't uh, in the bag considering like I said, how long the race was, how the tires were wearing. So Tim Hyman, he obviously had that all. I mean, and that's the thing about Hyman and the spade racing drives. We haven't seen many uh, mechanical failures besides the one we saw at Monza. They got it out of their system when they notoriously blew their engines at the start of the race. They got that out of their system. But they, other than that, they've been very meticulous and calculated when it comes to getting those spade machines uh, to that podium, those podium uh, positions when all things are said and done. Yeah, just looking at some notable results there, you've got Ole Marius Merveld picking up the 10th position in the end, which is good for him. Emil Solberg, I noticed having a puncture, I think, in the last lap and finishing down in 13th, even though he was fighting up there uh, in 8th position. So David Yunt ends up picking up 8th after his incident early on in the race. And Lewis McGlade rounds out the finishers, uh, I believe, no, sorry, we've got more than that. It was Lewis McGlade in 20th, so a top 20 in his debut in Division 1. He'll be delighted with that. Fabio Asuncao picks up 21st for go speed with Miguel Cardoso in 22nd and Eric Devite somehow finishing the race in 23rd. So that rounds out our, our finishing results for race one here from Milan's Ringen and we'll be back very shortly with race two. Inside SimRacing.tv, the fastest show on the internet. Sim Racing news and reviews since 2007, with new shows every week. GamePod, the ultimate race rig for those serious about sim racing puts you in the driver's seat with all the controls at your fingertips. 
be number one on the road, in the race, in the game. GamePod, the choice of ch So we are back here on the live broadcast for round six of the Virtual Career Cup from Milan's Ringen. Uh, and if you want to find out more about the Touring Pro Series, head over to Touring Pro Series. <laughs> Touring, <laughs> this is not going well. TouringProSeries.com for all the latest news and information. Head over to Facebook.com slash Touring Pro Series and give them a like and you can keep up to date with all the latest info and broadcast links and etc. Follow them on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash touring underscore pro and if you want to see any, literally any, of the broadcasts and I'm sure, I think it was Michael Gillespie worked out how many hours of broadcasting Touring Pro Series has done over the last years and uh, the number was so big that I've forgotten it. But if you want to watch any of those broadcasts head over to YouTube, youtube.com forward slash touring pro series. So, we had a bit of an interesting race one. Tim Heineman, double record breaker. What are your thoughts on that, Danny? It's uh, obviously very interesting. and It's funny, you mentioned during uh, the actual broadcast that uh, in our ELO rankings, he's now broken, broken the all-time record set by Keith. He has the most points ever accumulated by that system. And to those that don't know, the ELO rankings, those are something taken from... I, the ELO system, right? Something taken from chess, okay? And that's something that just normally happens through the progression of time. I remember back when Bobby Fischer was playing, I believe the top score at that time was maybe a 20, uh, uh, 2,700 or whatever. Now we see uh, routinely at least six players in the world that can go 2,800. So that's usually something that happens with, the, with, the, with that system over time. Players usually do get... Uh, higher scores as time goes on. So I just thought that was a very interesting point that you made. And I know it would have to have been Ryan Collin, our producer, that gave you that statistic during the event. I'm not really sure if we have any fans that follow the TPS that would actually point that out. But I just I find that interesting. I just wanted to clarify that very quickly there. So we'll take a quick look at what's going to be coming up over the next few weeks in the Turing Pro Series. This is, of course, the uh, the four winter series we run. The Virtual Career Cup is the fourth uh, series. So, of course, they run every race is run every second week. And this was the last to start. So we're coming to the final rounds of every single series. This, of course, being the penultimate round of the Career Cup. So first on Tuesday, we have the Virtual Mini Challenge from Mid-Ohio. And that will be the epic championship battle that we talked of earlier between Eric Strana of Ice Cold and Chris Butcher of THR. So within the next three or four days, this is very simple maths, I know. But um, within the next four days, we will see a new TPS champion crowned. And that will, of course, be the second one in a short period of time because next Saturday will be the final round of Virtual Super Tech Series, a championship that's already been uh, sewn up by Alexander Lauritsen, who has managed to bag himself a drive in the Shirokawa Cup for next year. So a great week for Alex and massive congratulations to him on winning that championship. Really didn't have any threat uh, all through the season, he was just utterly dominant. And, uh, you know, drivers came and went. Gergo Baldi was there for a few rounds and didn't manage to sustain. You know, likes of myself and Danny tried to get a few good results and ended <laughs> up crashing out quite often. But, um, you know, many drivers tried and nobody succeeded in getting close to Alexander Lauritsen in that championship. And, of course, uh, the virtual touring masters rounds off a week Wednesday at Mount Panorama. And that will be another championship epic between Wiesen Muller and Tolberg. So now you can see the driver standings in the Virtual Career Cup, and it's, I believe it's been updated by our wonderful Ryan Callan. So Heinemann is now on 487 points ahead of Gollenbeck on 448, with Jesper Tolberg in third. He's still only 28 points behind Marius Gollenbeck, so consistency paying off as it usually does for the Dane. And then, you know, jump 200 odd points back to find our fourth place driver, Eric Strana, on 288. Chris Butcher is on 287 in fifth position. Diogo Silva has closed the gap to the guys in front on 279, and Kenneth Yeoman on 247 points is in 7th. David Yunt up to 8th on 245, with Boyd Bryce in 9th, and Oscar Hardwick, who picked up a DNF in the last round, rounding out the top 10. Interesting that, obviously, Eric Strana wasn't even with us yet, and still holds on to his 4th position uh, in the championship stands. Remember, Chris Butch and Silva, they were both 5th and 6th going into that first race, but obviously things just... Completely went awry for those two. weren't able to pick up enough points to pass Eric Strana. Now Strana considerably can now finish 
Uh, if he comes back for Mount Panorama, he can still finish with a very uh, respectable championship and still finish ahead of Chris Butcher and Silva. So Silva, Butcher, they definitely want to get on it if they want to get a nice little gap to Strana. So we're just heading into the qualifying session for race two at Elon's Ring, and because of course, even if you thought the action was all over, we still have another 34 lap race plus qualifying session coming to you shortly. So we're going to look at if there's any drivers out there so far. Siggy is already on a lap. Why don't we keep going with him for a while? Because he's been slightly out of the limelight for this round in particular. Still picked up a decent result in race one, but was a bit quiet until getting involved in those battles near the end of the race. So he'll be looking to put an impressive lap in qualifying. Heads to the end of the lap now, coming through turn 11 and 12, heading down towards the right hand turn 13. Uh, and I believe these corners do have names, but they're very difficult for someone from Scotland to pronounce. But <laughs> this is the Castro something, so we'll just call it Castro Corner, heading round uh, that corner to head towards the finish line of what's his time going to be. I don't think it's a very good lap from Siggy so far. It's 106.9, and he will, of course, improve on that as the session goes on. Pops himself into third behind Pico Rodriguez and Tim Heinemann and straight away into a 105.7. Yeah, I mean, it's so easy that Heinemann gets into those 105s. Remember, only three drivers that are able to do that 105 uh, or break that 106 mark to get inside the 105. Of course, that's Heinemann, that's going back, and then Chris Hack was the third driver. So, uh, curious to see if anyone else can then get inside those, those 105s. I'm just curious to see if what Talbert can do. A junior goes there with a 106.8. Even Hack goes 106.8 at, at this point. Remember, Hack also started off Q1 pretty slowly. Took him to the, I think, the final two minutes of Q1 to really pu push the pace out that core racing car. So I expect expect him to really kind of get going with maybe after another five minutes or so. But so far, nothing uh, uh, really that surprising at the front high. Uh, going back, go second, another driver going to the 105s, but to Vite or on a 106 flat so that he's going to be very happy with that. I think he only managed a 106.1 or 106.2, actually 106.1 definitely in that Q1 session. So already he beats, he beats his Q1 time. We'll see if he can go even quicker in that ice cold racing car. Yeah, having Eric to Vite towards the front of the grid for this one could add an extra bit of spice as it already has many times this season, we've seen a mass, couple of massive crashes from Eric. Uh, just looking at Marius Gollenbeck doing a very, very slow three tenths faster than Tim Heinemann in the first sector, which is of course very easy to do. But we better keep an eye on him. But yeah, Eric Tavite had a terrible race one, ended up three laps off the pace by the end of it, or four laps, I do believe. Uh, just a bit of a shocker. And if he can keep it together in this one, he's not a man who's usually incredibly good in his tyres, but he's not known for being bad either. So it's going to add another, as I said, another spice into the mix. And he's, of course, a TPS winner. He's a podium finisher in the Virtual Career Cup. And he's one of the men, the only men, to even think about challenging the Spade guys. As Golombek goes pole with one and a half tenths quicker. And Heinemann is also coming through the final corner now. So obviously following his teammate quite closely. He is on the purple lap at the moment. So this should see him jump up to pole position. And it doesn't. He improves his time to a 105.666. But he's still four hundredths of a second off Marius Gollenbeck and he's going to need to improve on that if he wants to be at the front of the grid but even when he's not been at the front Danny he still seems to be able to win all the races. Yeah because I mean we've seen Gollenbeck start on pole position a few times and you're right John I mean even when Gollenbeck is able to do that Hyman is just it's only maybe five laps before he's into the lead and he just streams right through so but at the same time Gollenbeck was able we saw it maybe three tenths uh, you know d uh, uh, down on his teammate uh, in that first sector, and I don't know what kind of almighty pace he came up with in that first sector to do that, but if he can get one more lap like that and then capitalize in sectors two and three, then we can easily yet again see going back take this pole position. But as it is now, it's provisional time over 105.6. I don't think that's going to be able to do it. I, I fully expect Hyman to get closer to his 105.4, which is what we saw, I believe, as uh, the Q1 pole time. Yeah, Florian Voigtje jumps up to 7th position in that one, so that's a great lap from him. Man who retired very early on in race 1, looking for redemption here in the second race. Sergio Jr. I just noticed into 4th position, and Eric Tveit also improving his time to 105.836. Still not enough to get within a tenth of the guys in front, but still a decent time, and I'm sure if any, even if other drivers improve, yeah, he'll be alright in the end. Nice to see Voigt there in 7th position. Obviously, I think he started maybe 17th, I want to say, in that first race. Uh, obviously, this is the driver who's kind of had tr trouble uh, uh, transitioning his, his pace from... Remember, this is a, uh, a driver that came from a Gran Turismo 5. Uh, that's where he met Florian Strauss in the, G in the German 
uh, uh, GT Academy. And so we're, we're talking about a, a world-class talent in Florian Voigt, uh, him ascending to that realm of sim racing, even in GT5. So he's a driver who's had trouble kind of transitioning to R-Factor. This is his first proper uh, 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 instance within R-Factor inside the TPS here. Obviously one of the top sim racing leagues in the world. So he's I, I've expected the learning curve to be a little sharper with this driver, but and we've seen him kind of, you know, pelter off, pelter off rather in mid-season. I'm curious to see if he can now finish the season with uh, Pacers really try to push for that top five because I think that's the type of driver we're dealing with a driver that can go out and get top five performances has that type of pace within him hopefully he gets a little bit more comfortable of uh, uh, maybe by the time we get to Mount Panorama yes so with only three and a half minutes to go in this qualifying session some of the you know news of the arguments and you know controversy that we all love a bit of in TPS coming through from race one and we've had a couple of incidents that we didn't really pick up in the broadcast and one I've been told to quote Ryan Callan here uh, one of the stupidest moves of the winter by uh, <laughs> Fabio Asenkau uh, who's unfortunately seemed to have got himself in a bit of a pickle in the first race taking out a couple of drivers so he'll be looking to not make the same mistake in race two it shall be said and hopefully um, be keeping an eye on the incidents and penalties for him after the race but he's obviously had a bit of an incident and we have had some major controversy that I don't know any information about in particular so I'm not going to give any details but I do know there's been a bit of a major argument uh, and a bit of a shouting match going on between one driver in the field and one driver not in the field so um, uh, well, we'll pick up on that later on but it seems to be a bit of TPS drama which I'm afraid we all love too much not to share with everyone watching. Yeah, it's always unfortunate when the drivers get hot under the collar like that, you know, in between the races. So it it, it does happen. Um, I mean, like I said, uh, you, these guys are trying so hard out there to do the best they possibly can. And, you know, sometimes tempers flare, but hopefully these guys can kind of get that under control before they, they, they cross the line that it's kind of hard to uncross, to put it that way. So certainly, hopefully, uh, cooler heads will prevail. And hopefully we can actually see a nice, entertaining race, too. Yeah, well, obviously, if people cool down then it might not be as entertaining, so let's, let's get all the drivers incredibly annoyed and see them crash into each other and we'll see a massively exciting race. With, <laughs> maybe a driver qualifying down in the top. Oh my goodness! And <laughs> Just as I speak of crashing. Uh, one of the pink cars, I believe that was Mervold, won't have done himself too many favours with our championship leader. Yeah, now see, that is actually, I'm not, yeah, this watch is so many I'm not sure what happened. This is actually very critical because we're about within a, only a minute and a half left in this session. And oh. Yeah, uh, Miracle straight into the back of Hyman. Hyman has to pit for damage. Uh, and now we're seeing that he might have one more look at a pole time. Uh, if, if not, that crash right there may have cost Tim Hyman uh, a potential pole. And it looks like maybe going back, his teammates want to take that P1 starting position. So... Not really sure. I mean, this is not the first time we've seen Old Mary's Miracle kind of factor into these Q sessions, particularly with these spray racing drivers. That's all I'm going to say about that, but definitely not the first time we've seen that happen. So, not really sure what's going on inside the cockpit of that uh, pinky power car. Well, it looks like, it looks like Miracle's obviously been paid in a kind of mafia type <laughs> situation to take out Heinemann to make the racing more interesting. But, um, no, that, that was a very peculiar one. Either hit the clutch instead of the brake, and I'm not going to name anyone who's done that before because it was me. Uh, and plowed into the back of him, or he simply made a massive error because uh, that that was interesting to say the least. But Tim Heineman is only going to have one lap to set a qualifying session, so thanks to Ole Marius Murvold, it's made it a bit more exciting. You know, he's got one flyer, it's do or die. Will he take the pole position away from his teammate? What do you think, Danny? Ah, uh, you know, that's the thing. He's got to be quite a bit annoyed behind uh, the mirror vault hitting him like that. So, I mean, can he now fight through the anger and the nerves to get this pole lap done? But at the same time, we know Tim Hyman. Every time there's a bit of pressure involved into a situation, he just gets better. So, I'll say it right now, Tom. He's taking pole position. Well, we'll... The split times will soon tell us how his lap's going. Heads into the chicane in the middle of the lap. We've got a car off in front of him, one of the core guys. Uh, just managing to get out of the way of him, but Heinemann's three and a half tenths off. It doesn't look like it's going to be the pole position unless he pulls an absolute miracle out of the bag. We have seen him do a 105.4, so it's not impossible that you know to be three tenths down and still manage to gain it back, but it's highly, he'll, highly, highly unlikely. He'll never get pole time with that, because that thing, a going back is a 105.6, that's nothing to sneeze at. I mean, the 105.4, we only saw that one yeah, thing, there gone. it is, four tenths there. It looks like going back's got it. Not really sure what happened with the core racing driver at the beginning of the lap, but Definitely seemed to take something, take a little momentum off of Heinemann. Uh, at the, but at the same time, I think that that lap was pretty much done by the time he got 
to the corporation driver Eric to fight goes for a spin. Uh, he's obviously in uh, third position. Jasper Tarberg also got into those 105s to 105.9, so that's definitely something worth note. Dad, don't, don't really think he's going to be able to improve as the session clock hits zero. Uh, Diogo Silva, very quick time from him uh, in the fifth position. Sergio Jr., Chris Hack, Yoko Gorin. Again, very uh, compressed, I think, would say from fifth down to maybe even ninth position ninth or actually no no we're going all the way down to 12th 12th position Florian void time void to remember it was seventh position all the way down to 12th now but it looks like it's very condensed only a, a two tenths in it uh again within that fifth to 12th range so certainly it's going to be very i expect a very highly contested fight uh for those drivers in those positions so Jesper is going to abandon his lap because he was five tenths down. And that brings us to the end of the qualifying session. So it's going to be Marius Gollenbeck ahead of Tim Heinemann. And he will be hoping to keep it that way for the race if he can keep out of trouble. Because we've seen Marius make mistakes this year. He made another one there in the first race. And I mean, obviously you can't speak too badly of him considering he's been second once again. But he's going to have to do a lot of work to stop Tim winning this one. But I do think it's possible. Eric Javite will be sitting in third position on a 105.8 ahead of Jesper Tolberg. Looking to make it a spade one, two, three in this one. Diogo Silva will be starting in fifth position ahead of Sergio Jr. on a 106.0 it looks like. Uh, Chris Hack also on a 106.0 had a great race one and will be starting in seventh position for this one. A little bit of work to do there for the Englishman ahead of his teammate Yoko Gorenk in eighth position. Another impressive performance by him. Mate Orban is in ninth for Optimum, a DNF in race one and he'll be looking for redemption with David Yunt involved in a few incidents in tenth position. Pipo Rodriguez will be starting 11th for GT Competizione and Florian Voita will be starting 12th and Danny if you'd like to take us through the rest of the grid. Yeah, Florian Voita in 12th, Kevin Siggy 13th position for obviously positive sim racing. Uh, Ken Yerman, THR 14th position, uh, ML Salberg Ice Cold Racing 15th, uh, Heinz Petzold Core Racing 16th position with Gary Lennon right in behind him in 17th, Thomas Erzin 18th position with Luca Peklash for Core Racing in 19th, Boyd Bryson uh, starting in 20th position, another core racing driver before we get to Kel Stenbeck in 21st. Uh, Anders Nelson 22nd with Fran Lopez for positive sim racing in 23rd. Miguel Cordosa 24th position with Davey Van de Veen, Van de Veen, Van a, <laughs> I'm butchering his name, sorry Davey, in 25th position. Uh, Santiago Nazar 26th where we have Lewis McGlade right in behind on 27 with Fabio Asuncao in 28th. Remember, Asuncao, he's been accused of some very not-so-good things in that first race. <laughs> and rounding out our field today, only 29 cars in this race, too, is old Marius Miravolf, where it gets better. So, uh, certainly, uh, I think we had maybe, what, seven to eight, maybe even eight to nine DNS, I want to say, in that first race, John. So, hopefully, we have a, a lesser number in the second race but uh, certainly a lot of the drivers are already a little bit tense going into this race too yeah, i'm sorry about my terrible standings for dating there daddy <laughs> but, um, we've got two minutes left to warm up and i've been told i'm allowed to talk about the uh, incident we saw after the race and i can reveal the drivers involved in a bit of an argument where oscar hardwick who we saw have an incident earlier on and i believe robert feeson miller so um sorry Robert, if you're listening to um show up the argument here but it, I think what happened I think Robert's gone up to talk to Oscar and Oscar's had a bit of a go at the THR drivers obviously something to do with the incident between Yunt who by the way we called it to be Oscar's fault more than David's so that's that's something there but I think Oscar wasn't too happy about it and it looks like that just developed into a massive argument and a shouting match between the two of them so a bit of TPS drama there for you uh, and hopefully you know maybe, maybe we might see Oscar's anger channeled into a quick result here who knows but it's going to be very interesting for the race. Now, if our viewers are wondering, okay, what the heck does Robert Wilson Miller have to do with this? Okay, he has, he's not a driver. He has no real, you know, uh, uh, ties to this race. But that's, in fact, wrong. He is a, one of the THR, a part of THR hierarchy, okay? And THR, you know, obviously he's, he's in the chat with his drivers and Davey Young. Davey Young probably had some words uh, he, he said, you know, uh, during the race, once he had his contact, with Oscar Hardwick. Remember the teams and drivers are all separated into different team speak sections. So uh, Rob probably took it upon himself to go talk to Oscar Hardwick about this. Uh, Rob not being in the race themselves, he can just jump up to a different team speak channel. And of course, like John was just illustrating, Oscar didn't like that so much. So that's kind of 
uh, how that all started. But obviously, uh, Rob was just kind of serving as the THR liaison in this type of race to just deliver that message. And that's probably where this whole kind of argument stems from. Yeah, so I'm sure that will be developed, uh, you know, as the season goes on, maybe a bit of a rift developing between those two guys, which is a shame because they're both drivers I know, um, are, you know, are good, clean, sensible racers, and obviously tempers can flare, and that's what was exactly what we've seen there, so hopefully they get their differences sorted out and don't take out each other on track, um, although saying that, that could be very interesting, considering the next time they'll be against each other was probably going to be VTM at Bathurst, so maybe expect a few cars flying through the chase, but... We are about to go to the grid for race two here at Yolan's Ring. And will Tim Heineman make it 10 from uh, 10, from 10 Danny? <sighs> I would love to sit here <laughs> and say anything different, but at the same time, give the man credit. Nine in a row. Let's go 10, John. I, obviously, Gollenberg's going to factor into this thing. Tavite's going to try his best, but I do think Heineman just has a measure of these cars. Well, let's go 10 for 10 for Tim Heineman. Well, I know there's a few guys watching on that are feeling Chris Hack's on for a win here, so um, that's a potential one there. But I don't think Hack's going to do anything from seventh, especially with the two Spade guys in first and second. And we saw, you know, Chris was in the best possible position to do something in third last race, and obviously I didn't nearly have the race pace. So unless something happens to those two front guys, I don't think that'll be uh, the winner. But we could see Chris make his way back up for another podium. He'll have to fight the likes of Tolberg and Tavite. But I mean, you can't really say anything about Tim Heineman because. I mean, it speaks for itself. I say the same thing at the start of every race, and we've run out of words to say about the man. But the, but the thing is, I think Gollenbeck at this track does have the pace and the race distance to stop. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's obviously got that pole position. Whether or not Miravort kind of helped out with that pole position, we, we, we can only speculate on. But at the same time, yeah, we did see flash from Gollenbeck where he kind of equaled the pace from the other teammate. Whether or not, the, the whole issue is that Hyman is very strong at these once these races kind of open up. Those first five laps is kind of where he takes the fight and makes the overtake at some point to his teammate. That's what tradition what we've seen over the course of the season. If if Roland Beck can somehow keep Hyman behind him for the first like, six laps, I think this thing might can kind of sh change hands and then maybe going back actually has a chance at this thing. But because yeah, he, Hyman's got the record, he's pretty much got the championship seal at this point. No reason why Gollenbeck wouldn't want to take this win outright for himself, uh, but at the same time, if he's able to do it, there's a whole nother matter. I mean, and also there's of course the factor that in sim racing, any time things can happen, incidents can occur. We saw in qualifying Heinemann getting re-rendered by an out-of-control pink car uh, of Oli Mar Marius Merville. So, obviously Heinemann's not invincible, his car's not got four shields around it or anything like that, although by the way the season's going so far, I probably wouldn't be surprised if it did. But, um, you know, anything can happen in these races. You can get taken out by a back marker, uh, and, or simply Marius Gollenbeck too, could be too quick. We just don't know. And this track seems to be, after the first race, giving me the impression that it's difficult to overtake. But if you can get alongside someone, there's going to be a lot of side-by-side -side action. So, even if there isn't too many open to overtaking opportunities opening up, once they are open, we're in for some cracking racing, so let's see some more of that in race one as the guys line up. As you can see, a stunning shot from the back of Marius Gollenbeck's Porsche as everyone lines up on the grid. And at this point, Marius Hart will be being incredibly fast. As you see, all the cars wait, just waiting so agonizingly for the cars at the back of the grid to take their position. As we ride now on board with our pole sitter, you're going to see the lights on the top right hand side of your screen are going to light up very shortly. I think it'll be four or maybe five red lights and then we'll go straight to the green and we'll be underway here for the second race of the penultimate round of the Virtual Career Cup 2014. The lights are on and underway we are. Marius Golenbeck's himself got a decent start from the inside on the left hand side of the grid and he does lead into turn one and to fight, oh he gets into the back of Heinemann, it almost happened early on but Heinemann's kept it together and it's up to fight spinning again. He's gone, he's gone. And there's contact too, another car is off. They are piling up off the grid. We'll try to see who Ooh, exactly carnage. is involved. Gorge, he's one of the cars involved, obviously. Sergio Jr. might have been involved with that. Kenneth Yerman is now up, up, moving down the field, as we're seeing there. Lewis McGlade also slides off. Obviously, Eric Tavai, another one of the oh, drivers. No. That's just an absolute, I mean, we saw such a clean start for the first race. After the, the, the second race, though, not so much. Cars off left, right, and center, straight off the bat. And I would take a replay, but I think there's way too many incidents to cover and we'll be here till the end of lap 34 trying to look at them. But I know that Asim Kao was involved, Tavite was involved, there was probably a car from every single team. There was Kenneth Yurman, I believe, a core car, just so many cars involved. 
And um, a bit of carnage there on lap one, and I'm sure that'll be an interesting one to look back on the server replays after it. But Gollum Beck does lead on lap one. To Heinemann was almost taken out by Tavite at the start of the race, who's once again thrown it all away in the early stages, Danny. And he just seems to throw away too many good results, does Eric Tavite. And that spice that we put into the mix earlier on has been taken out straight away. Tolbert into third, Diogo Silva up into fourth, so a good start from GT Competizione driver David David Junt looking to continue his race one form except to try and try to avoid the spin in this one with Chris Hack in sixth, Diego Rodriguez seventh, Kevin Siggy in eighth, Emil Selberg in ninth and Fran Lopez rounding out the top ten. Yeah and uh, it looks like, like you were saying there John, Tavite looked like he was going to uh, add a little bit of variety here at the front, unfortunately he goes off straight away. Spice now we're seeing spice is the word. <laughs> spice, okay we call, you call it spice, okay. It, Tavite looked at a little spice, it didn't happen. <laughs> and now we see Spade, Spade, and Spade as the first three drivers in the race here today. Uh, Diogo Silva now uh, tucked in here behind Tallbrick. Uh, even still, despite uh, Tavite throwing it, uh, 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 mixing around in there, <laughs> adding the spice, like you say, John. Uh, yep. <laughs> I'm in only three tenths off of his teammates, so it looks like going but couldn't even take advantage of all that kind of uh, controversy to start the race, and already Hyman is t trying to, going to uh, have a look for this race win. Yeah, and I'm just hearing as we see Diogo Silva get up on two wheels uh, through the corner, I'm just hearing there might have been actually contact between JT, Jesper Tolberg, and Eric Tavite heading into that turn two that caused uh, the Scandinavian to spin and caused that massive pileup. So that's a definite possibility as you look at Diogo Silva now. He's down to fifth, he's been passed by David Young, who's having a stunning race so far, flying the flag for the non-spade drivers in fourth position. He's got his former teammate Jesper Tolberg ahead of him, and David's shown great pace throughout this weekend. I'm thoroughly impressed with him. Yeah, uh, it looks like uh, Jan is able to kind of shake off that type of incident he had with Oscar Hardwick, which really seems to be spilling over. You're noticing Hardwick not in the race here today. Chris Butcher out the race here in the, in the second race, rather. So it seems like there's a real residual effect between whatever obviously went on between Hardwick and Wiesemuller. So uh, certainly not 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 good. But regardless, like you said, John, David Yutt, this just seems to get him motivated. Now he's having a look for a podium position. So Yutt, certainly not backing down, certainly not being distracted. And this is very commendable considering how much of an argument it seemed like there was, there was uh, what, what kind of words were exchanged after this race. So well, well done for, for it, Yutt to kind of take it to another, another level uh, just off of some, some type of controversy like that. Yeah, it was a bit of a strange one, but he's obviously taken the momentum, as you say, and used it in a positive manner. And look at the man he's pressuring right now, Jesper Tolberg, you know, trying to say to him, you're in the wrong team, you shouldn't have left us in the first place. <laughs> and um, David Jun is really is being the hero of this race so far, up into fourth place. We're only on lap four, but he's managed to stick with Jesper so far, and we know how good he is in his tyres. Could we see him stick with him in the race? Quite possibly. Diogo Silva's already dropped back a bit in fifth position with Chris Hack right behind him in sixth. So, um, Andrew Waring, who predicted Chris was going to win this one, I don't think it's happening so far, my friend. Piper Rodriguez is down in seventh, ahead of Kevin Siggy in eighth. Emil Selberg is in ninth, and Fran Lopez holding on to that tenth position, the man who drove 150 kilometers to take part in this race. We can't emphasize enough how impressed we are with that, and he deserves a lot, a lot of credit for that commitment. Marion Golubek sets the fastest lap of the race on a 105.7 at the front. Florian Voita, the man who retired in the first race, is running 11th position ahead of Gary Lennon, who's having a slightly better run in this one. Thomas Erzin in 13th, with Heinz Petzold in 14th. Shell Stenbeck rounds out the top 15 so far, with Mervold in 15th, in 16th I should say, Boy Bryson in 17th, and just looking down the order, did Lewis McGlade with his controller manage to avoid that wreck in turn 1? It does look like it, because he's in 23rd, maybe got caught up in it a little bit, we don't know, and he's got the battling Niza and the recovering Eric Tavite for 21st and 22nd, right in front of him, so... This could develop into an interesting one. Let's see if Tavite, we don't know if he's got damage, but let's see if he can make his way back up through the field. Yeah, he's not going to get too much pressure pressure by way of Nizad, McGlade, and Nilsson in behind him. So, uh, unless, of course, he's got significant damage on an ice cold machine. I think I think that car is looking relatively healthy at this point. So, definitely, I think uh, Tavite could be on for a nice little rise through the field. Going back, meanwhile, we're, got, we're getting through uh, lap five. Uh, this was the, the number I gave, lap six. If he can finish lap six in front of his teammate, Tim Hyman, I think going back has a chance at this race victory. Uh, I know that that, 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 that that number seems quite arbitrary, but at the same time, I do think it's an emotional win for, uh, uh, for going back to 
stay in front of his teammate this long. I do expect that Gorenberg is not going to factor into this race for the for, for uh, the duration of these 34 laps we have in place. So we we have Spade against Spade. I think I've earned this fight for the win finally, John, and I'm I'm looking forward to it. I mean, just absolutely nuts. Look at the gap back to third position. We have six and a half seconds between first position and third position. That's just unheard of. But do not scratch your eyes. We are seeing Tim Heinemann in a race, not at the front of the field, for the, probably the first time since Monza and the first time uh, for Tim Heinemann in the Touring Pro Series. He's not leading a race, but lap six in the race. And there's a car in front of him, Daniel. It's not a bad one. And this is actually happening. But we've got Jesper in third. He's just managing to pull away slightly from David Jan. So I, I hyped him up so much, and he isn't quite managing to hold on to the Dane at the moment. But a lot of time still left. Chris Hackett running in fifth position. He's got ahead of Diogo Silva, who almost rolled it earlier on. His teammate, Pippo Rodriguez, is in seventh. And then the battle goes on for eighth and ninth between Kevin Siggy and Emil Solberg. But we are now in lap seven out of 34. A long, long way to go. Uh, a couple of retirements have been... Kenneth Yurman, who was the THR car I saw spin across the track in that early carnage at Yoko Gorenk. Unfortunately, a DNF from such a good qualifying position from him, so he'll be gutted with that. And Sergio Jr. as well. We saw how close to the front he was, and he's down in 26th. Yeah, and I, it's nice to see a nice little mid-pack fight, or this is really kind of an upper pack, uh, considering we're going from hack in fifth position all the way down to Mel Sawbreak there in ninth. So a nice little five, four car battle here over some very premium positions as Mill Salberg falls off the back of Siggy a little bit, just makes a slight mistake. And meanwhile, it seems that like Hack is starting to creep in to cut some time away from David Yunt. So if Yunt isn't able to find the outright pace, this pack of five is going to get to him and we're going to make it a pack of six for those top positions. I'm hearing uh, Eric Tavite actually managed to roll his car while trying to pass Fabio Asuncao. So, oh boy. Um, it's not unfamiliar as we see Eric plowing into a wall, but uh, he, he's managed to roll it once again, so... <sighs> I am convinced that Tavite has some type of broadcast <laughs> uh, machine where they, he knows the camera is exactly on him and then he just uh, 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 call, uh, goes on to flip his car, especially when the, when the camera's going on. So we probably want to get off to Vite because he's probably saying, thinking, okay, right about now. Because <laughs> he does this entirely almost. too often. Yeah, almost. He gets a little sideways, exiting the final corner of the track. So let's get off to Vite for his own safety. As now we have uh, Marius going back, continuing to lead the race, and Hyman is creeping to him. He's right there. But like you were saying, John, it's a very hard track to over overtake on. So not really sure where Hyman's going to have to find a way to work to kind of work this out. So far, so good for going back. He continues to lead this race from his teammate. I mean, this is exactly what we want to see. We, we see Heinemann, the man who's dominated for so long, in second position in a situation where he needs to fight. He's still got a chance of winning, so it's not like, you know, this man who's won every race has no chance. He's got a very good chance of winning, but he's got the best man to stop him in front of him. And this is the situation we've been waiting for for the past nine races, is can someone, once they get in front of him, hold him up for the rest of the race, or either pull away if they're faster. And Golubek's the one guy that can do that, and it's just a matter of time to see whether he will do that. Uh, and just as you were talking about Eric Tavite there, I was... Some, thoughts were going through my head such as maybe he should try powerboat racing or something that doesn't involve <laughs> keeping wheels on the track or just anything like that just just not sim racing for the moment for Tavite because he seems to like his roof far too much uh, or hate his roof far too much that he wants to crush it every time he might but want to try it, Olympic uh, skiing or something like that yeah, yeah, take a lot of air time very well or maybe being a crash test dummy or something I don't know but it's Gollumbeck <laughs> from Heinemann is the two cars you can see at the moment for Spade Racing they've already built up an 8 second gap to the man the most successful driver you know only, only the most successful driver in TPS it's no, no biggie 8 seconds to Jesper Tolberg and the, the, he is 2 seconds ahead of David Yunt and I worked I found out why Yunt managed to get up to 4th position is when Diogo Silva was up there he almost crashed into Jesper while trying to pass him and that's how David got past him so a bit of drama we missed there. Uh, Chris Hack is still running in fifth, but closing in on the THR driver. Looks looking racy, and he's got good pace around here, so he might be able to just get him. You know, uh, looking further down, we've got Fran Lopez dropping back down the order by the looks of things. It must just be a good battle that's going on. Fran down in twelfth, and he has been passed by Voita and Gary Lennon by the looks of things. So 
Fran Lopez dropping slightly down the order, but he's probably being careful on his tyres because he doesn't want to get another puncture like I believe he did in the first race. Hold on a minute, John. I think we are seeing the impossible. I believe that is a Gary Lennon, Leno sighting on the on the Division One broadcast. Lennon has has been absolutely nowhere in these flat six cars, uh, but finally he's very broken inside the top ten for ice cold racing. Uh, I believe only second to his ice cold the ice cold teammate uh, Emil Solberg. So there he is in the flesh, Gary Lennon, a sighting on one of these Division One broadcasts. Well done to you, Mr. Leno. Yeah, I mean Gary's a man who, of course, is a team Touring Pro Series winner. He's competitive in so many different leagues he runs in, but he's just struggled so much in these cars. I don't think he's put in the time. Uh, practicing as much as some of his, uh, his, his teammates have done, such as Eric, although well, he does manage to keep it more on the track than Eric does, but he t yeah, he's just been struggling so far this season. He's been nowhere in the standings, he's been having incidents he right, left, right and centre, uh, but he's in the top 10, so it's great to see, as you say, and uh, well spotted, Mr. Asbury. But he is, of course, ahead of Florian Voita and Fran Lopez, who's just sliding out of there with uh, Thomas Erzen in 13th for core, Heinz Petzold, his teammate, down in 14th, and Shell Stenbeck in 15th for Optimum. So I believe Optimum, Optimum are having a slightly stronger race this time, and I don't want to curse him because Shell almost spanned there. But Florian Voita in 11th, Shell Stenbeck in 15th. It's going better than race one did. Yeah, obviously Voita now has a chance to get inside that top 10 Stenbeck as we're riding on board right now, inside the top 15. So certainly in some nice points paying positions here for Autumn Sim Racing. Have been very consistent this year, so it's nice to see them continue that here in uh, as, as it were the sixth round of the championship. So back at the front, we are now in lap 12 of 34, and it's Marius Gollenbeck, who's just on a 105.8, so still lapping quickly, 12 laps into this tyre-killing race by the looks of things. He's still holding on by four tenths from Tim Heinemann. Jesper Tolberg is still dropping back, and it's obvious, I mean, it's been from the start, we know it's going to be a two-car race for this one, and it's just a battle for third position after that. Tolberg's managed to kind of build the gap from Jun, and I don't think jun has got the raw speed to close back in on the Danish driver, so Tolberg's pretty safe in third position at the moment. Uh, and Yunt is under, coming under slight pressure from Chris Hack. There's a second in it. And Chris, once again with him, is at 1.3 seconds behind him is people Rodriguez. So it's not as if he's in the middle of nowhere. Uh, David Yunt, he's still got some work to do to hold on to fourth position. But if he can pick up you know, a top five in this one, I think justice will be served after his race one uh, antics. He's, he'll be absolutely thrilled with the top five. I know David didn't particularly do that much testing going into this one. He said uh, he wanted to get a top 15 before the race, so to be inside this, be this high up in, in, on, on, in the field, to be, he was challenging Talberg for a few laps there. I mean, he's going to be thrilled with that. I mean, in the, in the first race, he had a chance to get a, a top five as well. So David Young showing very good form here, uh, and especially considering the, the controversy and all that type of thing, to keep his head cool and to stay relevant in this race. It's very well done for Mr. Young. Yeah, I just thought I saw some type of action there with Siggy and Lennon, but I believe it was just lag that was causing the standings to swap. So maybe Siggy experiencing a few internet problems here, but he did lose. Um, couldn't see them in there in the broadcast. There was a bit of server lag. So hopefully Siggy's able to recover and his internet doesn't drop before the end of this one because he's running in a strong ninth position and looking to keep the consistent points finishes coming in. He, of course, is sitting 11th at the championship at the moment, just outside the top 10. And he's looking to move ahead of Oscar Hardwick and break into that top 10. But he is, as we say, in ninth position. In the middle of nowhere, he's a second behind Diogo Silva, but he's a couple of seconds ahead of Gary Lennon. So there's not really any big battles going on right where he is at the moment, but he's doing well for positive sim racing. Just not really. take a look kind of right to the back of the field because we haven't really covered them since lap one to see if there's any drivers that are struggling around with damage. We have seen a few cars off the side of the track with missing rear wings and such, so we're trying to see who those guys are. So you've got Matty Orban in 16th, rounding out the three top four drivers in the top 16, which I'm sure they'll be delighted with considering their race one. Miguel Cardoso in 18th, ahead of Boyd Bryson, with Santiago Nizat in 19th, Kevin Siggy's teammate, and Andres Nielsen in 20th, also for Opera Sim Racing. Then you've got Fabio Asimkau in 21st, with Miravold holding on to 22nd, and hopefully there's no speed cars within a couple of meters of him. You've got Lewis McGlade doing a great job, actually, holding on to the back of Miravold in 23rd position, and of course, after his 20th place finish in race one. Davy van der Vene is in 24th, obviously got caught out in the early incidents, with Sergio Jr. running around on his own moment in 25th, and you've got Eric Tveit. So, it didn't, it didn't look like, he didn't look like he had too much damage when we last saw him, Danny. And we were talking about how if we look at him, he's going to roll, and he's now out of the race with an accident. Something went on there with Tavite, obviously. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to, to kind of chronic, uh, chronicle exactly what goes on 
with Savite doing his races, obviously, just because that's the thing of John DeMitt. He has he'll have an incident, then he'll have another incident, then he have two or three more incidents, and those other ones are off camera. So they just kind of com the mistakes compound with Savite. So I I'm sure something else happened, and he just you know said I I'm done with this, and he pulled out for the time being. But that's about four cards that are DNF at this point. Luca Pecklash, Kenneth Yerman, and Yoko Gorinch, the other three. So. Uh, it's four drivers. Remember, we lost maybe eight in the first race, so it's about halfway to that mark already. About 20 laps to go on the board. I noticed a few laps ago it was Floyd and Voigt that ran into some trouble. Well, it was the 11, so I down to 14, but uh, so far he carries on. I think it was a slight mistake from him, but we're still with the leaders. Hyman is absolutely going nowhere, but just cannot work out exactly where to have a look at his uh, teammate Marius Golenbeck. He just slots him right behind his spade racing teammate, and they just carry on. But uh, uh, Golenbeck still, with about 19 laps to work with now, uh, has a uh, has an extremely tall order in front of him to keep this man, the nine-time race winner, uh, 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 Tim Hyman, in behind. I, if he can still, if, if Golenbeck is able to pull this off, I will be shocked, John. Absolutely shocked. Well, I don't think it's your surprise. I think I've seen it coming all season. Um, I've seen Golden Beck showing that potential to win the races and just not managing to put it all together. So, you know, you know, once he hooks one race together and gets a better start than Tim Heinemann, then actually manages to not make any mistakes and do the lap times he's capable of. I knew it was possible for him, but it just didn't look likely because Heinemann was on such a good run. And as I saw in race one, just ran away with it in the front uh, until Heinemann, until Golden Beck made a mistake and the gap was even bigger. So, yeah, but as I say, I'd be delighted for Golden Beck if he won this race. Um, and at the same time, I'd be delighted for Heidemann if he can extend his run. John, look at that 24 car in behind Golden Beck. Do you honestly feel that that man, the man has won nine straight races in this race right here? Do you think Golden Beck, that would not surprise you if Golden Beck stayed in front of him the whole race? Is that what you're telling me? Well, no, I mean, I, I, I do see what you mean. I mean, Heidemann is looking incredibly racy and intimidating, but. You know, we've seen Gollum Beck have the pace. We've seen him quick enough to beat Heinemann. We saw when he was eight seconds down in the last race, he managed to close the gap slightly before the end. And while he was four seconds down, he managed to st you know keep the gap stable. So it's not as if Heinemann's you know a full half second a lap quicker than Gollum Beck and just waiting for his move. But obviously, it would be you know a, a, a big surprise if Gollum Beck can hold off Heinemann. But it, it's it's there to be done, and I, I just believe that it is possible. And it has been you know creeping up all season. Gollum Beck's been showing the pace. That he has on Heinemann, and despite how aggressive Heinemann's driving, uh, if Golenbeck can hold on and also hold on to his tyres, which it looks like Heinemann is not really taking too many regards for at the moment, saying that he managed to hold on to them pretty well in race one, um, you know, we all, all we know is we're going to see a big fight in our hands and we'll see what happens by the end of this race. But it would be great, I think, for both drivers. If Golenbeck wins this race, it'll be great for the team and great for him personally, and a bit of a sight for the rest of the field to show that Heinemann can be beaten. At the same time, if Heinemann wins again, he just maintains his dominance and it's 10 wins in a row and pushes that record further out of reach and just shows more how much of an incredible talent he is. Now, just as we that, as, as you say that, it seems like uh, going back has got maybe a second win here. We've seen, we're seeing that gap now rise to half a second. Obviously, that still isn't much, but at one point, it was about two tenths. So maybe going back can now have maybe a slight amount of breathing room, and maybe maybe he can get this one done, John. I mean, certainly, I don't see it, but may, maybe going back does have something in that spay racing machine to kind of outdo his other spay racing contemporary and Tim Hyman. I guess we, uh, we, we, we've got about half of a race to go, so, I mean, certainly a lot on the cards here, so. So we are, as you say, just past the half distance. You're lap 18 of 34 here at Yulan's Ringen. And it's a long race. I mean, it's one of the longest races of the season, considering the, you know, the slow nature of the track um, means that the times, although they're they're still quite low down the one the low one minutes, they're maybe higher than they could be, you know, considering the track is only, I believe, 2.3 miles long or 2.3 kilometers long. I'm not quite sure in that one. So apologies for that. But if it, we could ride down really with, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you here, John. If we can ride down with positions 12, Matteo Orban, and back, it seems like it's starting to pop up. Earth and actually just spun out Fran Lopez. Remember, Lopez drove 150 miles, just uh, uh, kilometers, just to uh, attend this race. They get, get spun out there by Thomas Earth and the core racing driver. And yeah, we're seeing it on replay here, just touches the back rear quarter uh, panel of that positive sim racing machine and sends. Mr. Lopez around. Certainly, he's not going to be too happy about that. Not much contact in that. that that's 
Uh, not really sure how the stewards going to look at that, if that's raising it or not. But regardless, Lopez loses a few positions and now has to make it up. It looks like he's still got Erzin in behind him. So Erzin, I guess he gave the position back. Yeah, and looks like things Lewis McGlay in the pits. I, the fact that it's lap 17, or 19 should I say, would suggest that he's making a tyre stop. And it's good to see someone um, showing a bit of ingenuity and actually going, attempting the tyre stop. And that does not, of course, mean that it's going to improve his, his race time and, and be better in the end for him. But it means that he won't get a puncture and he'll be able to finish the race when other guys start dropping off. So, an interesting tactical decision. I'm pretty sure I just saw Marius Miravold involved in an incident in the back of my screen, and I did. Because Miravold's obviously just had an incident with... Uh, might have been, was Asenkau again? I believe it was Asenkau again, so him not having a good race. Uh, Sergio Jr. just in behind them. Let's see what happened here. So, ah, no, okay, it was Miraval who span on his own, so apologies there to Asenkau for blaming him there. McGlade just misses them coming out the pits, and Asenkau manages to regain his composure, as does Miraval, but time loss for both of those guys there. And Pinky's down in 21st position now, so um, that was a bit of a dramatic incident there. Now, you just talked about uh, 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 the drivers pitting for tires, and obviously we, that, that's what we're speculating Lewis is doing in coming into uh, the, the, the pitch just halfway point of the race. Now, this is, that's something that's kind of, as we're seeing, uh, Tim Hyman once again close the cap on his teammate, but uh, drivers pitting for tires in these sprint events uh, within the TPS, this is something that you very rarely see uh, amongst the top drivers, I mean, there's few, there's a few moments that's worked out brilliantly and it's absolutely killed people. <laughs> uh, one of the moments where I guess it's kind of worked out, and it's up to you if you would consider this a sprint event. I know in, in virtual tournament season two, Toby Davis in a move like that, similar uh, uh, to what we're seeing, I guess, in Lewis McGlay, where he pits from the lead, in fact, and then winds up to go on the winning race with no one else around and pit it, okay? But at the same time, virtual toy mass races tend to be a little bit longer, so sometimes uh, I'm not sure that you can classify those as sprint. But I remember Ryan Collin infamously did this uh, in a... Uh, in a yeah, in, in, in a virtual in a virtual Clio series race, so uh, and he absolutely killed himself. I mean, gave away a podium position by pitting from the lead. Wanda no. fishing. I believe no, he finished second. Actually. He finished second, just to he, correct. So he didn't quite blow away a podium finish, but he did blow away his chance of winning. He, fi he fin you're right. He finished second, but there was one of the notorious moments in TV history where someone actually pitted from the lead in the sprint race. So it's certainly something not you don't see much, e despite this being a 34 lap race here today. Despite it being so hard on the tires, that's why you don't see any drivers at the front really trying this because it's certainly something that hasn't really had much of a track record of work, John. I mean. I mean, that was actually the second broadcast I ever watched in the Turing Pro Series. Uh, the virtual, uh, or as it was known as the Euro Se Clio Euro Series yes, back in yeah, the day, yeah. was um, yeah that was the second, that was the, the first series I ever watched in the Turing Pro Series, and it was showing the drama was starting from the get go. But um, yeah, it's always something drivers talk about to try and make other, you know, fool other men into thinking it. I remember in my first years of the Clios, there was races where tire wear was quite bad, and it was like, oh, I'm going to do a tire stop. Are you going to do a tire stop? And you're just wait, some of them are bluffing, some of them mean it, and um, it's, you don't really see it often, usually it's a bluff, but um, considering how bad I was on my tyres, it probably would have helped me a couple of times, but yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see uh, whether anyone does it, but we're, because we're past the halfway stage now, I think nobody else is going to try it, so at least McGlade showing some ingenuity there, and the funny thing is, he'll probably come to us at the end of the race and say, oh, I was just repairing damage, it wasn't tactical at all, but we'll give him the credit anyway. Uh, obviously we don't know what happened there, but this is a good battle developing for 8th position with Silva for GT Competizione holding off Positive Sim Racing's Kevin Siggy, a man who has had a good season so far, both of these guys had good seasons, with Siggy picking up a podium at Norris Ring and Silva of course leading the championship after two rounds, so Silva's season's dropped off a bit, Kevin Siggy's is still probably on the rise you could say, although this round has been not quite up at the heights of Norris Ring, but still not bad at all from him. And those guys are having a good battle for 8th position, I'm sure they'll be enjoying that one. Yeah, remember Sig, I think he was sitting in 9th position for a majority of that first race, wound up finishing somewhere uh, around there. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Silva, this is the type of round that he's going to need. Remember, we talked about him not being able to pass Strana despite Strana's absence. Well, now Butcher has not shown up for the second race, so now it looks like Silva's going to jump up to that fourth position in the overall championship standings because obviously Strana and Butcher, the two, his two championship rivals, are out of this race today. And Silva, obviously, as you just saw, running inside the top ten. This is the piece of gold that we're talking about, you can see right now. You've got him 
one and a one point one seconds ahead of Heinemann. He's obviously, you know, stepped on the gas. And obviously held his tires slightly better than Heinemann. He saw sliding about earlier on, and he's managed to bridge the gap over a second. So, Colin Beck, for the moment, we're not going to put any curses on. So, I'm not going to say anything. So don't put any curses on. But he is leading as as we reach lap twenty-four. Well, I'll step in and I'll, I'll, I'll put a curse on it if you will. This is the first time I've seen Golan Beck now actually look likely to win this race. He's actually taken the fight to his teammate. He's not just held him up, but like you said, John, he's found the pace. He's got a gap. This is his race at this point, okay? He's got, what, about 10 laps to work with here. This is my Golan Beck's race. If he can just now do the business, he can get his second race win of the season. And, you know, we give all the hype to Hyman. We kind of take some great at going back. But going back won a race at Monza. Uh, uh, he won the second race of the season. So, I mean, he's got a race win under his butt already with the team. Yeah. Now, it's, now it's the only kind of can he get that second race win. And so far, so good, John. I mean, I think he's got, looks like he's got a legitimate chance now to take this race win. Yeah, he's increased the gap by another two times in the second on that previous lap, which was 24 of 34, so nine to go now in this one. You've got Jesper Tolberg in third, David Young in fourth position, now under serious pressure from Hack. So all through the race, Hack's been closing in the gap slightly and is now really close to the back of David Young. Yeah, but remember, we saw even Hyman couldn't have a look even on his teammate going back at any point, really, during this race. I'm not sure if Chris Hack's going to have what it takes not only get to Davian, but find a way to work out overtake, because these overtakes are just coming uh, so far and few uh, at this track that I'm not sure if Hack is going to be able to get this job done. But certainly, even right now, he's got to be thinking about where he's going to get this move done. You've got to be very meticulous when getting this done. Otherwise, you're just going to find, you're just going to get up to the car in front, and you're going to wind up strolling behind him for, for lap after lap after lap after lap. And right now, with only nine to work with, you simply don't have time for that. But yeah, Chris Hack, he continues to hold it on in fifth position. People Rodriguez quietly, quietly got, uh, uh, just strolled into the top uh, 10. It's right outside that top five. Remember, people had the DNF in the first race for a uh, GT competition on it. Has fought back. And people as a driver, kind of had an up and down season. Did remarkably well, or, you know, had a remarkable pace at Monza. Got demoted to Division 2. Kept, kept his head down, just fought like, I don't know what to get back to Division 1. And it's just stayed there. It's been a constant force for GT competition. You know, I really have to commend this driver for really uh, sticking with the championship despite running into a lot of hardship he has as a driver. So right now, sitting in sixth position, very well done for Mr. People Rodriguez. And most Saulberg right in behind him in seventh position. Saulberg, remember, he was in eighth position, but it seems like he's gotten around Silva. Not so sure if Silva's made a mistake or if he's just been outpaced, but so far, he continues to sit in the 8th position, Kevin Siggy in behind him, in ninth position. It's kind of made up a little bit of ground on Diogo Silva. Uh, not Again, not really sure. I think he's in the same position, Chris Haxon. Not sure if he can just not only get to Silva, but can he work out someplace to actually make this overtake? That's going to be the interesting bit as Gary Lennon continues uh, to talk. I mean, to, to hang in behind uh, these drivers in 10th position. Uh, it's interesting about Lennon, uh, Matty Orban, uh, we saw obviously Voita, I think, had the biggest chance to overtake Lennon, but of course, Voita ran into some trouble a little earlier. Now Voita's down to 16th position, but here is Siggy uh, uh, having a move on Silva, trying to outside of turn one, not sure if this is ever going to come up. So far, Silva just holds the line, that's a smart move, and Siggy's just going to slide him behind him. And see, this is what I'm talking about. It's one thing to get to a driver, but I mean, you can't make a move on the outside of turn one. That's not going to work. Just not not good enough planning from Mr. Siggy. He's got to find a way to get his car on the inside. That is the way to do it. That's the clinical way to make overtake around any circuit, and, but and that's doubly so here for this uh, circuit. So we'll see how this one develops moving forward. Yeah, Gary Lennon just coming in there behind him, so obviously not big gaps there. And Gary could be on potentially for a top eight if anything happens between these two. And we do see things happening in the TPS because the last time we saw, last time we said that somebody's going to pick up from an instant front was, of course, the instant between Hardwick and Young. So it's definitely possible uh, for Lennon to pick up pieces if these guys end up getting together. But they are two mature drivers we've seen all season, Silva and Siggy. Uh, both been consistent and, um, yeah, they've both been driving very cleanly indeed. So it's going to be difficult 
you know, for Lennon to pick up that eighth position, but if he can keep the pace down and put these guys under pressure, he might just be able to do it. And he's, of course, the man you can see there in the background. A Siggy has a little look down the inside, heading into turn two, but nothing off him there. And I'm just being told by Ryan Callan a bit of very interesting information about GT Competition 1A, the team which I did not know myself, and I'm sure most of you will be unaware of, but they actually all race from the same place. So they're all racing from the GT Competition Centre in, Port in Porto, I believe. So that'll be why. They all, it's all Portuguese drivers because I don't think anyone from you know the UK or Canada or anywhere is going to travel over to Portugal to do a sim race, Danny. But um, it's great to see that kind of thing. is very interesting, but it's it's also it's very good to see. Um, it obviously shows they're taking it seriously, but I mean it means they can all communicate together and you know get to know each other. This is actually very interesting. Now you see similar things like that happen. I know with maybe the top first person shooter teams they have team houses obviously maybe you know professional that's a professional gamer thing to have a kind of a team house so to speak where you actually have people in person playing video games together uh, not really sure what uh, in sim racing obviously i mean that's that's a quite a bit of financial uh uh, 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 uh uh equity that that takes to get something like that done i'm curious what it is that gt competition shoney does to kind of afford something like that or yeah, I was just uh, thinking that. yeah if the team house belongs to them or if it's just a place they all get together and meet to play and drive these races together it's actually very interesting i'm curious to have more information on something like that yeah, I mean, I'm sure we'll, I'm sure we'll pick up more information. You know, now that we know that that's the case, we can try and find out more about it for the next uh, next broadcast. But uh, yeah, it's it's good to see. I mean, it shows that there's a lot of professional, you know, the, uh, profession. What's the word I'm looking for? It's very professional uh, the way they're going about things, and it shows how good the league is. And the fact that these guys, you know, they're doing well in the championship. But a team as professional as that, they can be spending as much money as they are. You know, getting this this. Um, building together they all race together and uh, obviously all the equipment needs to be paid for and everything like that but it shows how good the league is and the fact that those guys aren't just running away with the championship and dominating you know having spent all that money and you know to, for them all to be in the same place and something as serious as that an operation for them not to be winning every race and, and stuff like that we, we don't even we haven't seen GT competition only win this year of course due to the the speed of spade and um, kind of pays dividend how competitive this league is yeah, and I, mean, I said it can't really be taken as a slight to GT Competition, but they, like they haven't won because I mean, for Pete's sake, Spades won every race this season. So I mean, if you're going to slight GT Competition, you have to also slight ice cold racing. You have to slight THR. You have to slight core racing. I mean, it's pretty much not just one team. It uh, it's it's it's. it's Actually, it is one team. It's Spade Racing against the field, as it were. And it seems like Spade Racing is on a completely different level. I mean, if it wasn't for Spade Racing, then I'm pretty sure these other teams like GT Competition, uh, uh, Ice Cold Racing, Core Racing, they would have race wins. I'm 100% I'm sure at this point. So considering how kind of, uh, you know, average THR has been, they haven't been that good either. So uh, it's just been Spade Racing, just been a class above everyone else. As once again, you're seeing them uh, lock out the podium in, in, in clinical fashion here. So, but continue, but uh, continue at the front. The only thing still leading this race. So, only about only about three laps and change here, here to go here, uh, John. And looks like maybe you called this one right. That going back, he sipping. Maybe 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 we shouldn't be surprised by this. Maybe we shouldn't be surprised, like you were saying, that going back is so far again this job done. I mean, you shouldn't be surprised if you look at the fact that Olmec has the potential to do that kind of you know that kind of pace that's quicker than Heinemann over a race distance, but it's just surprising that he's managed to not make any mistakes and under the pressure managed to hold on to it. And the gap is down to 1.2 seconds, so it's not all over and done with yet. And um, they both do have back markers to deal with. Uh, so for Hein Heinemann, if he wants to do something about this, he's gonna to need to absolutely go flat out, get everything out of those tires that this left of them, if there is anything left. And Gollenbeck just needs to be smooth, keep out of trouble with the back markers try and use them to his advantage and just hold on for three more laps and we could see for the first time in nine races someone other than Tim Heinemann cross the line to win the race and um, that would be quite something and very impressive but uh, you know Heinemann still did a great job in seconds you know it's, it, even even if he's not winning the races if he's trying to win the championship you know Heinemann pretty much has this side sealed and delivered the fact that if he doesn't win a race he's still going to pick up second place in terms of championship points he's still a different league 
Yeah, I, it's going to be hard to see. Obviously, we're going to join the mountain kind of around, around seven after the race the other day. So, I, it, it's going to be hard to see Golenbeck taking the championship from his teammate. Like, I, like, like you were saying, John, looks like he's got this thing signed, sealed, and delivered at this point. As Chris Hack, uh, 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 yeah, Chris Hack has has caught up to David Young, but only, and there's really nothing in this one at, at this point. But it's about a lap and a half to go. Can the hack work out exactly where to make the overtake? That's that's been the whole question here uh, for this track. Uh, who uh, qualifying position matters so much? Track position matters so much. Not really sure if hacks will be able to get that one done, John. Something's happened to Diogo Silva, and oh my goodness, there's two GT competitions. The only cars that have gone off, and there's a bit of lag by the looks of things. Let's see if we can catch what happened here in the replay. And Rodriguez is out, and what on earth has happened? Uh, there's so much lag on the server, it's very difficult to tell, but there's two GP GT Competizione cars off the track. We have no idea if they made contact or not, but parts flying, you know, black and orange parts flying everywhere, and you've got Silva sitting there pretty much out of the race, and people Rodriguez out of the race, so if, if this was an incident between the two, which unfortunately we won't be able to see until the server replays are released, but if that was an incident between the two, there's going to be some loud noises and loud arguments happening right now uh, in that centre we speak of. Ah, oh, this is this is catastrophic, really. Because Silva, he was set to make up a few positions in the championship. So, oh. uh, and who is this? I think Fran Lopez Voita. And, and Voita. Voita lost the front end of that car. So a lot of dri drivers running into some trouble here, losing a lot of body work as this race progresses on the final lap. These guys don't want to be attacked by the stewards in the final lap of the race here. But meanwhile, Voita is not going to be denied trying to run the outside, not getting that one done. Look who's right behind that battle, it's our leader Marius Golenbeck. He's increased the gap to 2.4 ahead of Heinemann, so Heinemann's obviously had a slip up somewhere or conceded defeat by the looks of things. But look at the bad markers that Golenbeck got to deal with, and these guys are crazy. Voita and uh, Fran Lopez just need to let this, need to let the leader by. And thankfully Voita is obliged and he has let him by, but, and so does Fran Lopez, that's good to see. But obviously, too engraved in their own battle, they didn't notice the leader coming up behind them, and they had to be really careful there to let Golenbeck through, and it's lost him 8 tenths, but not enough to split the leaders here in this race because Gollenbeck now comes around the final corner on the final lap and you no, know, you are not watching some, you know, something completely different. This is actually happening and Gollenbeck is actually going to win a race in the Virtual Career Cup in his round six at Yilans, Yilans Ringing and he has beaten Tim Heinemann, his teammate who's won nine races in a row, a new record, but that record will go no further which leaves it open you know, for other drivers to beat in the next coming seasons. But Heinemann hasn't won the race. He still finished second, but it's Marius Gollenbeck stay here. Very, very good job from uh, Marius Gollenbeck. I, I mean, you can make what you will of Hyman breaking the record and then being beat by his teammates. So I'm not really sure what to what to read into that, but I do think that was a genuine race win from Gollenbeck. Uh, so well done from Mr. Marius Gollenbeck. Takes his second race win of the season from his teammate Hyman. Jasper Tauber locks out the podium for a spade race in the third. Chris Hack fourth with David Yunt, Emil Salberg, Kevin Sicky, Gary Lennon getting up to 8th position thanks to Diogo Silva's uh, kerfuffle in GT Competizione, Matte Orban in ninth, and rounding out your top 10, Thomas Erzin for core racing. And just look at the man who finished in 8th position, Danny. What exactly did we say about 5 <laughs> laps ago? Gary Lennon in 10th position needs to wait for the instance to happen and he will pick up the 8th position. And what happened? You know, two guys both ended up in the wall and out of the race. One of which our former championship leader, Diogo Silva, who finished in 18th in the end. And the other one, people Rodriguez, who retired. So it just goes to show, you know, everything we say is, you know, we're, we're not making that up. We're not saying that for the benefit of the entertainment. We're saying that because it's true. You know, these things always do happen. And um, you just need to be there in the right position at the right time, and it will come your way as long as you can finish the race. And Gary Lennon has picked up an eighth position, his best result of the season, I'm sure, uh, with Orban ninth, as you said, and Thomas Erzin running out the top ten. You have Heinz Petzold, his teammate in 11th, with Shell Stenbeck 12th for Optimum Sim Racing. Fran Lopez making the journey worthwhile, picking up another top 15 result for him in 12th, with Florian uh, in 13th, I should say, with Florian Voita finishing 14th ahead of his teammate Anders Nielsen. Santiago Niza finishes 16th for Positive Sim Racing, with Boyd Bryson in, eight, in 17th. Diogo Silva finishes in 18th in an incredibly damaged Porsche ahead of Davy van der Venne for Airstream, who got involved in the early instance in 19th place. And I believe that is all our finishers. Yeah, it seems like the attrition rate was pretty high for this one. Uh, we do have a few other drivers. Fabio Sankara, 20th, 21st. Sergio Jr., Louis McGlade, 22nd. Old Marius Miravold, 23rd. Uh, 24th, 
will be the last of our runner, runners for GP Competition Miguel Cordoso. The DNFs uh, are uh, People Rodriguez, Eric Tavite, Luca Peklas, Kenneth Yerman, and Yoko Gorn. So at least Louis lost five drivers as opposed to eight in the first race. Slightly better, but we only started with 29 drivers thanks to Hardwick and Butcher both opting to pass on the second race. Obviously having something to do, I would assume, with that whole THR against Oscar Hardwick uh, uh, kerfuffle to start that uh, the, the, in the middle between race one and race two. But uh, regardless, 29 cars started, 24 finished. Very nicely done for the drivers today. So the main headline, of course, Tim Heineman is beaten in the Virtual Career Cup. His run comes to an end, but that being said, it's not been a bad day for him, breaking two records no, no, in the no, process. No, no. Yeah, and no, we're going to get headline... all the drivers' reactions coming up shortly just after this break. Inside SimRacing.tv, the fastest show on the internet. Sim Racing news and reviews since 2007, with new shows every week. GamePod, the ultimate race rig for those serious about sim racing puts you in the driver's seat with all the controls at your fingertips. Be number one on the road, in the race, in the game. GamePod, the choice of... So we've had two dramatic races here at Yilan's Ringen uh, for round six of the Virtual Career Cup 2014 and we've seen a different winner apart from Tim Heinemann but of course it was Tim Heinemann that won race one and increased his winning streak to nine races, a new all-time Touring Pro Series record beating the previous record of eight from Stoffel Van Dorn and also breaking the record for the highest ELO ranking score uh, ever accumulated beating Jack Keithley's record on that one so um, a bit of a record breaking day for Tim and we're going to talk to him first so um, if you're able to speak to him obviously you've got the championship you know in your hand at the moment you're the only person uh, that's able to throw that one away and it doesn't look like you're going to do it judging by your season so far just how have you managed to be so dominant this season? Uh, I just don't know um, yeah hard training good setups and yeah that's the result and yeah I think uh, I was better in the races and Marius make uh, uh, not so much mistakes and yeah that's the result. And then obviously in race two you didn't have the best of qualifying sessions and I say that it was still a very good qualifying session but Marius just pulled one out the bag uh, so just talk us through your race two because obviously you kept him under pressure for the whole thing but couldn't quite do anything in the end. Yeah my pace was not so good as in uh, race one and Marius was just faster than me and yeah, in the end, uh, I looked at the tires and yeah, just want to finish uh, the race without the puncher because uh, the tires uh, were, were not so good at this track. But yeah, Marius was uh, just faster. And so, uh, congratulations to his win. And obviously, you've got just Bathurst remaining, an iconic track. Uh, with one round to go in the championship, you're so far ahead. Are you still going to go all guns out for the win? Or are you just going to be a bit more safe and make sure you pick up the points? Yeah, a win uh, would be very great, but yeah, the championship is uh, to, uh, yeah. Well, massive congratulations to you, Tim, and of course, you've extended your, well, actually, sorry, leveled the championship lead uh, as the championship standings come up on your screen now. But that was Tim Heinemann, our new double record breaker and looking very good for the championship. And Danny's now going to speak to, finally, a different race winner in the Virtual Career Cup, Marius Golenbeck. So, Maria, so I'm not going to ask you for, about the first race. You were solid finish in second, but in the, in the, in the second race, you, you get it done, you get the race win. I mean, talk us through how it was the mentally to keep Tim Hyman on nine straight race win at that point behind you for the, for the entire race like that. Yeah, I don't really know how I did it, to be honest. I mean, <laughs> uh, basically, all you need to do is um, just keep your parole, just do what you practice. 
put your laps in, but that's easier said than done, of course, because um, I've, I've seen that at Road Atlanta, at Thruxton, at every track we've been to, that a single little mistake could be enough to um, yeah, wave him by, or at least get him side by side, and as soon as he's passed me, I'm probably not going to get him again, so... Uh, first rule was just to keep him behind me and then uh, see how long I can do that. And um, luckily I knew, um, luckily for me of course, that um, Tim had a bit of more tyre issues than me. Um, we both had almost no tyres left in the end. So um, yeah, I thought maybe I have an edge there. And um, I think like five or six laps um, before the race finished, we both kind of took out a bit of pace because, um, well, none of us wanted to pop a tyre just before the finish. And um, there was already one and a half seconds between us, so we called it a day at that point. But um, until then, I mean, it's it's such a challenging track. It's um, it's the longest race of the year, and um, it's almost 10 minutes longer like um, any other track almost. So um, anything you basically do wrong just goes massively wrong. This track has so many turns, so many points where you can screw up, and so many points where you can actually lose the race on. And... Uh, yeah, 25 laps on absolute full pace um, is incredibly hard to just um, realize. So, um, big props to Tim in the first race, though. I mean, uh, it it didn't when uh, it didn't go much differently pace-wise in the first race for me, but just no chance to get him there. And I was three seconds behind him, then got like a five-second freeze, which I still have no idea why that occurred. And well, that was um, just a typical Tim performance there, just pure dominance. Well, let me ask you this then, because it seemed almost coincidental that the moment Tim gets the record breaker, gets nine in a row, then he's beaten by his teammates. So if, let's say, Tim had, hypothetically speaking, Tim had won seven races in a row, okay, and he still was on his streak and he still had a chance to break the record, would you have, okay, backed off at some point of that race to continue Tim's streak? I'm curious. Well, uh, whatever I want to do is um, combined to however I can perform. So even if I want to break um, Tim's record and not get um, him the nine in a row, um, I probably wouldn't have been able to do so because um, even if I said, okay, he's, he's not going to get it, I'm going to get this win. Um, I mean, I try. It's it's not like in the first race I just settle for second. Even if I'm three seconds down, I just try to um, get a good race in because um, the track is just so challenging. Anybody can do a mistake, but... Um, it's it's really not possible, and um, whatever I did, um, he just did a little bit better at all the time, so that's uh, what got him the nine in a row, but obviously nine in a row is enough, so <laughs> he can settle on that now. Well, very good. Well done today uh, for, uh, to you, both of you guys, and of course to you, Marius, for breaking the streak and getting the race win uh, today. So, John, you have our next uh, uh, guest here. Yep, yeah, uh, I'm going to speak to Chris Hack, but just before I do, uh, just a quick update on the Division 2 results from Race 2, uh, of course Race 1 as well. Uh, I think uh, Daniel Back, I believe, run Race 1 ahead of Ryan Walker and Dem Demo Meester. Sorry about the pronunciations, I am absolutely terrible at those. But um, in Race 2 it was Ryan Walker taking the win from Jonathan Ockerclint and Demo Meester. So... That's your top three from race one and race two. So well done to all the drivers involved in division two. And of course that race not broadcast. So I um, feel it's necessary to give them a bit of credit for all the work that hasn't been seen by the public. So well done to those guys. But I am now going to talk to Chris Hack. And now, Chris, you did a great job in race one to hold on to Jesper, hold off Jesper for as long as you did. So just talk us through that one. You know, what were your thoughts throughout the race? Uh, well, the front two were gone. So I was just looking after the tyres and then... I hadn't actually had a chance to do more than 15 laps, I think, so I, I had no idea if I could actually get to the end, so I was just trying to keep it quite nice and easy, and then Jesper was all over me, and it's a blur. Somehow it, he didn't come past. And then obviously that's you know a great result to pick up in race one, with only the spade guys beating you, but then a race two, you had to do a slightly harder race, having to fight your way through a little bit, but managed to get it done in the end and finish in, I believe, fourth position, or fifth position, I should say, uh, just behind David. So, you know, how did that one go for you? Uh, I locked into fourth, actually, because he got a puncher. But, um, yeah, it was all right. A bit busier, and I had damage, so I thought I was actually going to blow the tyre, but... Uh, my wear seemed to be better than the first race, which confused me because I felt like I was wearing them faster early in the race. But uh, I felt really unprepared for tonight, to be honest, but it went the best of the season. So, I'm looking at the championship standings. You're into the top 10 on 258 points. Obviously, you've missed a few rounds, so you're not able to contend really for the 
high positions. Is that, you know, is getting championship points a, an objective for you? Or is it literally just to go out of Bathurst and try and do your best? Uh, well, you know, points are always good, but I'm just trying to enjoy the last few rounds, really. Bathurst is an awesome track, so go there and try and get somewhere near the pace again and see what happens. Well, massive congratulations to you, Chris, and well done on uh, both races. Of course, picking up a third and a fourth, which is stunning in the series as competitive as this. And Danny's going to finish off here talking to a man who was involved in an incident in race one, but managed to get his great result done in race two. Oh, well, saying that, obviously the puncture in the last lap didn't help, but uh, Danny will talk to David Yund. So, David, uh, pretty much, I mean, I talked to you before the race started, and you weren't too optimistic going into this thing, so... What what happened? Where did all this pace come from to have these results here today? Oh uh, well, I'm not quite even sure myself. But when I did some laps, I thought, thought that the track was really fun to drive. I mean, I've I've had tracks where Monza where it's just too fast for me, and I don't like that heavy braking zones, and some other tracks I don't like that much. But this track in Denmark is really fun to drive, and I well. If you have fun, I think you're, of course, uh, do better, mostly. And so, well, I picked it up even after, on practice, in qualifying. The pace got better and better, and um, I thought, well, it, there could be something possible. And even if I kind of said, oh, just qualify the back and wait for everyone to crash again, I, well, I did my best. Top 10 qualifying which... Mm, Surprised a bit, I was looking for top 15, and I had two good starts, two really good starts in the turn one, even though people pushed me a bit in the second grade, but it was really the, the initial uh, spark to two to good performances, and well, I couldn't be much happier, really. Well, t talk us through exactly what happened with Oscar Harwick in that first race. We saw on the on the broadcast that you guys had an incident uh, where where there was contact between you two. I mean, how how was that from your point of view? Oh, um, I think Oscar after the first few turns he got a bit wide or uh, came across, and then I then took the inside for the next turn. He was alongside still. We kept going like that into the next turn, and. I was actually ahead, and then I don't know why he probably was looking for my inside again to pass, but we made contact. I, I even made, I even opened the door so we wouldn't crash. And out of the next time, we were still side by side. And then I tapped him over the curb, and well, we both spun. But uh, of course, he is probably not too happy, but I am neither because he just couldn't get away from me, and, and I thought he was holding us up and. I, I just saw that chance. I went side by side and I, I can't really blame myself. I, I did my best and in the end, well, it's a shame at the end it's like that, but I had to pass because I saw, I saw his rear end, how he was struggling at some point, and so I thought I, I need to get past if I want to stay ahead. So, we're sorry about that, but well, it's racing, sorry. Well, regardless, well done today, David. That puts you seventh in the championship standings after all things are said and done. Uh, good luck, obviously, at Mount Panorama, the final race of the season. And that's actually going to wrap up our driver interviews, John. So uh, let's throw this back to you. Yeah, well, of course, just to sum up, we saw stunning race one from Tim Heineman, who just ran away at the front and took a very dominant victory. And I know we've said it many times before, but in case you've just tuned in, uh, for the driver interviews, we have Tim Heineman breaking the record for the most number of races won in a row in the Touring Pro Series, and also the highest ever score accumulated on the yellow ranking system, and he of course tops that as well. So, great night for him, and also for Marius Gollenbeck, who managed to stop Tim just one race later from winning in the end. So, uh, yeah, that's that's very good night of racing, and good to see a couple of, uh, you know, good, good for both drivers, as to be said, for first and second in the championship. But before we leave, um, a little bit to, uh, to talk about with upcoming events as you can see here the virtual mini challenge will be live from mid ohio on tuesday night so tune in for that one live from 10 uh, 10 past 8 gmt and that's going to be the championship decider a very very important championship decider danny yeah this i uh, like we talked we touched on this during the races themselves but this is going to be one of those monumental events within the Tour bro series and of course we also have uh, v VTM and the reason I classify this championship about a little bit ahead of the VTM one is only because VTM we saw some things with Robert 
is only in that situation where he's losing the championship because he had some we- some technical issues. And you can say the same for v- VMC with Chris Butcher getting a disconnect, but that's a little bit more natural as, as far as I see it. But uh, regardless, this is the one, Strana against Butcher on Tuesday night. This is, this is going to be one of those ones. You only get this maybe once every few years, a championship fight such as this one. Like you were saying, John, a, a, a first-time TPS champ will be coordinated on Tuesday, I personally can't. I can't wait for it. I mean, I have nothing against Strana and Butch. I like. I personally like both of those guys. So whoever wins it, it's a good dude. So I, if, if you're a fan of TPS, if you're a fan of sim racing, make sure to tune in on Tuesday for this one. It's going to be a treat. And of course, the Saturday after that, so that's a week today, we will see another championship finale but it will not be for the the, the champion has already been crowned so Alexander Lauritsen became uh, scored his first championship win in the virtual super tech series and the f- penultimate r- the final round I should say of that will be on Saturday live from I'm trying to remember which track it is it's gone completely out of my head Sebring Sebring, Sebring there we go how, how could I forget that Sebring <laughs> was stunning racing last year and that was my first race in the what was then called the WSS, so I don't know how I managed to forget that, but that's going to be an exciting one to end off the season, and let's see if any upsets can be made, if anyone can stop Alex Lander Lauritsen from increasing his championship lead, because as he's already dominated, he actually dominated the entire season, no one came close, and he takes the championship by a long way, so massive congratulations to him, and best of luck in his future racing endeavours in real life. And then, the following Wednesday, is going to be the very exciting Mount Panorama. It's basically, the 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 Mount the first Mount Panorama event. Of course, we've got two in a row uh, with the the next round of this coming up straight after that. But the DRM mod, the ever famous Virtual Touring Masters Championship, will be finishing off its season uh, on the mountain, and it's going to be another epic championship battle between Jesper Tolberg, the most successful driver in the Touring Pro Series history. So even if he's not doing it in this championship, he certainly is doing it in that one. He'll be trying to take his Porsche to victory ahead of Robert Wiesemuller's Toyota Celica. And Rob, uh, only about, I believe, nine points behind or eight points behind Jesper in the championship. So it's still up for grabs. Uh, and that race will be an incredible end to an incredible season because those cars sound and look absolutely fantastic. So you won't want to miss that one. And that will be on a week Wednesday. And tune into that one from 8 GMT. So that's the upcoming events in the Touring Pro Series. Uh, and that kind of rounds off our, our thing, Danny. I mean, I'm not, not sure if you have any other thoughts. No, nah, I mean, obviously today we saw a the, the record-breaking day in the Touring Pro Series. It was great to see. Obviously, the championship, though, uh, as it were, is pretty much decided. But uh, regardless, I mean, I'm looking forward to Mount Panorama in a few weeks' time. Like you said, it's, I guess it's the second bath is because earlier in that week, we're going to be seeing VTM finish off in the, as they also go to Mount Panorama, the first Bathurst race. Uh, so in two weeks' time, the second Bathurst will, you know, just, uh, sign us out for this, which has been a very successful debut series for us in the Touring Pro Series, the Virtual Carrera Cup. And it's been fun uh, the whole way through, John, and hopefully we can have a, a, a nice finale two weeks from now. Yeah, it's been a thoroughly enjoyable season. And uh, absolutely honoured to you know be the, be one of the two guys bringing you the comms for this championship, and it's yeah it's just been a delightful opening season for this and many good seasons to come for this for this mod because it's a stunning mod. Uh, although saying that, I think probably we'll be venturing away from our factor you know reasonably soon because it is becoming you know rather old in the sim racing circle. But you know it's never lost any of its mojo and it still provides some great racing as you saw tonight. But so the only races to go then in this championship are coming from the mountain. And will anyone stop Tim Heineman or will anyone do a Toby Davis? It's yet to be seen soon. But for now and for me and Danny Asbury, thank you very much for tuning in. And we'll see you very soon.